Hello everyone and welcome to JavaScript Level 2. So far we've only really covered the basics of JavaScript and now it's time to expand our understanding by learning a little more about advanced material. And in this section we're going to be covering three main topics. Functions, arrays, and objects. Functions are going to allow us to reuse our code. Arrays are a data structure that will allow us to store data sequentially and then we'll learn about objects, which will allow us to store data with key value pairs. Three really important topics. And we'll also have exercises for each of these topics for plenty of practice. By just learning these three additional topics, we're really going to be able to expand our capabilities with JavaScript on the front end. Okay, I hope you're excited, so let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part one, functions. Functions are going to be our main building block when we're ever dealing with JavaScript code, and honestly, any code. They're going to allow us to easily reuse code more than once and not constantly repeat ourselves. If you've already programmed in another programming language, you may just want to check out the notes to quickly grab the syntax for functions in JavaScript. But if this is your first time programming, let's take a little bit of time to describe what a function is and what it's going to look like in JavaScript, and then we'll hop over to the editor and code out a bunch of examples. So the general syntax for a JavaScript function looks like this. You have the keyword function, and that's going to indicate that you have a function. Then you have the actual name of your function, and you're going to decide whatever you want the name to be. And then you also have the option of passing in parameters. And you could also not have any parameters. So here I just showed two parameters, parameter one and parameter two. And someone using the function could pass in parameters required for the function to do something with. So you would pass in those parameters and then inside that code to be executed, inside those curly brackets, you would do something with those parameters. So let's go straight to the editor and our console to really show how to create and use functions in JavaScript and get a better understanding of what's actually going on here. I'm going to jump to my editor now. All right, so I have my editor open. I have an HTML file that's linked to myscript.js. And here I have a blank myscript.js. And that HTML file is open and linked here in the browser. And if you want, you can also put everything that we're typing straight into the console, but it's going to look a little better if you put it into Atom. Let's start off with the most simple function we can think of, which is just a hello function. So I'm going to put in the special keyword function, call my function hello, so I give it a name, close parentheses, so it won't have any parameters, then the curly brackets, and inside this function, I input some code, and I'm going to input log, and we will just say, hello world. And this is the most basic function we can have. So what's actually going on here? I have my keyword function, then the name of my function. In parentheses, I'd pass in any parameters. In this case, we won't pass in anything yet. And then whenever this function is called, I will log hello world. So let's save this. If we refresh our page, we'll notice that we can actually call hello hit enter, and we get hello world. So in our browser, after running this JavaScript connected to this HTML, I can now call this function here. And what I want you to know is sometimes what happens is students get confused on how to call a function. They'll just type in hello over here with no parentheses, hit enter, and they actually get back the function itself. So the difference here is that one of these is calling the function, and the other one is just returning it. So I'm going to zoom in a little more here just so you can see what I'm talking about. In this case, I call the function to execute with the parentheses there. In the second case, I'm actually just calling the function, but I'm not executing the function. And in that case, JavaScript says like, oh, you wanted the function? Well, here it is. This is what the function actually is. With the parentheses though, you're telling JavaScript, okay, actually execute that function. All right, let's expand this example by calling the function hello you. And we will pass in a name. So that's my parameter name. And in this case, I will say console log hello plus name. So I will save that. Let's, ref let's clear our console and then refresh our page. And now what we're going to do is call hello you. Whoops. Clear console. Hello you. And note what happens if I just type hello you with no parentheses. It returns back the actual function. But I want to call the function. 
So I will say, hello you. If I just have parentheses with no name parameter, I'll get hello undefined. So that's important to note here. Because I expected something to be the name, a parameter to be passed, in this case, since I didn't pass anything, it just said hello undefined parameter. What I really should do is something like this, hello you, and then pass in that name parameter, which in my case, I expect a string there. So I will say, hello you Jose, and it says, hello Jose, in the actual console. So that's the very basics of a function that accepts some sort of parameter input and then uses it within the function code itself. And later on, we'll also talk about scope of a function, which is pretty important as well. But for right now, the basics here that I want you to get is that you can put in a parameter and then use it within your actual function code. And the main idea of a function overall is that I don't have to keep typing console.log every time that I want to do something. All I have to do is call hello you. And this is going to be really useful for more complicated functions. Let's expand this to a simple function, but a function that takes in two parameters. I'm going to delete this. And if you see, you can start typing fun, hit enter, and you get something like this, function name. Note that it's camel case, meaning that we don't use underscores, but instead we separate words by lowercase and then uppercase letters. In this case, no pun intended, I'm going to say add num as my actual function name, and then I will take num1 and num2 to be the function parameters. And then I will log num1 plus num2. So let me save this, and I will clear the console. Well, actually, I should refresh the page to make sure add num is loaded up. So here I refresh the page. Let's call add num, and let's pass in two and three. We hit enter, and we get five. All right, so what's actually happening here? Well, add num is taking in two parameters, and I called the parameters num1 and num2, and then inside the actual function code, that block, it's going to add them together and then log that. But let's see what happens if I say add num hello comma world. If we hit enter, we notice that we get hello world back. Something to remember here is that we can concatenate strings with this addition sign. So later on, we'll be talking about making sure that you have the correct data type you expect whenever you're creating a function. Because right now, this function is a little too loose in what it expects as a parameter. It'll end up working with either strings or numbers, which isn't very good for us because that means if we call this function later on in our code and we accidentally do something like this, add num, and we pass in maybe a two as a string and a two as a number, you'll end up getting something like 22. But that's not really what you were probably expecting. You may have been expecting four. So this is kind of a dangerous situation to be in because of JavaScript's type coercion. So usually you want to check types or make sure that the operations will only work on certain data types. So that's just a little warning, but we'll talk a lot more about that later on in the course. For right now, what I really want you to understand is that I have two parameters and I'm using them inside of my function call. Okay, now let's talk about default values. So, so far we've had to define every single argument or parameter in the function when using it. But we can also have default values by using an equal sign. And let me show you an example of that. Again, I will create a function here. The function name will be hello someone. It takes in a name and it will console log hello plus that name. But instead of having name be undefined, if no one passes in a name, I'm going to have a default name. And let's make that default name Frankie. So let's see what happens now when I refresh this page and I call hello someone. If I call hello someone with Jose as the parameter and I hit enter, I get hello Jose. But if I call hello someone with nothing inside of it and I hit enter, I get hello Frankie. So we can use an equal sign in this manner to actually assign default parameters in case a parameter is not supplied by the user. Okay, so that's default parameters. Now let's talk about returning values. So far we've actually just been printing or logging results. 
But what if we actually wanted to return results so we could assign them to a variable? And then we could use the return keyword for this task in this following manner. Let me show you what I mean by all of this. I'll create another function and let's call it formal. And formal takes in a name. We'll give a default name of Sam. And it also takes in a title argument. And we'll also give a default title of Sir. So we have two default parameters or two default arguments there. And the terms parameters and arguments are used interchangeably a lot. So just keep that in mind. And now I'm going to say console log title plus a space plus name. So let me save this. I'm going to refresh the page and call formal. I'll hit enter and it says Sir Sam. Great. So what if I do this? I say welcome plus formal. Well then it says welcome undefined, which is probably not what you expected. You expected it to say welcome Sir Sam. We can see here that it only outputted Sir Sam when the formal was called, but when I wanted to actually print this whole thing, it said welcome undefined. So if I were to actually put that all within a console.log call, so if I say welcome plus formal, and I hit enter, I get again welcome undefined. So you might be wondering what's actually going on here. And what's going on is this function right here isn't actually returning anything. It was just printing something one time. If we want to actually return something so we can use it in a variable, we need to use the return keyword. And let me show you how we can do that. We will just say return. You can see there's already a return keyword. And then say whatever you want to return. In our case, we'll return the exact same thing. Title plus space plus name. And now I can save this, refresh my page, and if I call formal, I still get the output Sir Sam. But now I can actually assign that value. So I can say variable output is equal to formal. But now if I call output, I get Sir Sam. Meaning I can also do what I wanted to do before, which was this welcome plus formal, and now I get welcome Sir Sam instead of just welcome undefined. Okay, so that might seem a little confusing at first, especially with these examples of showing the console log versus the return, but all you really need to understand for now is that if you wanna save the result of a function, you wanna use the return keyword so that it actually spits out something to return. So whenever I call formal, whatever it does, it's going to return what is on this line. So usually you'll have a bunch of code over here doing something, code, some more code, etc. And at the very end, you will return some sort of variable that you defined using all of this code up here. Let's break down a more complicated example by doing something like multiplication. So I will call a new function, function name, and I will call this function times five and we'll say num input. So it takes in this parameter num input. Inside of my function, I create a variable called result and set it equal to num input times five. And then I return that result. So far, so good. And then if I refresh this page, I can call times five pass in a number four, and I see I get 20 back. Okay, so that also means, since I'm using the return keyword, I can say variable, let's say variable answer is equal to times five, and we'll pass in another number 10 here. And now if I call answer, I get 50. I wouldn't be able to do this sort of variable assignment if I was just doing a console log of the result. Instead, with this return keyword, I can now assign the result to some sort of variable. In my case, the variable is called answer. Great, so we've talked so far about using the return keyword, using parameters, and also using default parameters. Let's take a moment to talk about a really important concept that's called scope. 
And scope is the term we use to describe how objects and variables get defined within JavaScript. When discussing scope with functions, as a general rule, we can say that if a variable is defined only inside a function, then its scope is limited to that function. So let's consider the example we just showed here. Times five, num input. We created a variable called result equals to num input times five, and we returned result. If I call answer, I get 50. But if I try calling result here, I get result is not defined at anonymous. And the main idea here is that the scope of result is limited to this function. That actual variable doesn't exist outside of this function unless I define it outside of the function. So again, as a general rule, we can say that if a variable is defined only inside of a function, then the scope of that variable is limited to the function. So it's only going to be recognized when it's called inside of this function. And the same goes for these parameters. So if I come up here, back to the console, and try to say something like num input and hit enter, I will also get a not defined error. So that means that this has a bit of a whoops, local scope to the function. Now let's try to make something with more of a global scope. So the global scope is going to be different than that local scope. And basically what happens is if we have a variable that we define outside of the function, that's going to be a global variable. And the function will have access to them due to their scope. Let's show an example. I'll create a variable. It's outside of any function. And we'll call it v. And this is going to just be a string that kind of really obviously is going to be a global variable. So we'll say global v. So that stands for global variable. So we can see variable v, just a big string out there. We'll also make a variable called stuff. And we'll say, have it be a string global stuff. And now I'm going to create a new function. It's going to be called just fun. It's going to take in stuff. And it's going to log v. It's going to reassign stuff inside. So I will reassign it literally to a string claiming its reassignment. So reassign stuff inside func. And then I will log stuff. And let's delete this top function here since we won't be using it. OK, before we actually run this, or let's break down what's happening here. I have two variables defined outside of any function. Then I'm calling function fun. I have stuff as a parameter, but no, I never actually am going to call stuff. I'm just going to do this, fun. And then I'm going to say console log v. I never define v inside the function. It's only defined up here. I will reassign stuff only inside the function. And then I will say console log stuff. Let's save this and run it in our browser. So refresh and I get this, global v, reassign stuff inside function. Now let's add one more line of code after this function call to execute the function. And I'm going to say this, console.log, and I'm going to log stuff. And let's see what happens when we actually run this code. So let me save that and refresh and run. So it says global v, reassign stuff inside func, and then global stuff. Okay, let's break down all the lines of code here and actually explain what's going on so we get a really clear idea of scope. So this whole idea that we're talking about right now is known as scope. So the following happens. Console.log v is going to check for the global variable v, the outer scope. If it can't find anything there, then it's going to check for the local scope inside of the function. And if it can't find anything there, then it's going to throw an error that it was never defined. Console.log stuff over there at the bottom will also check for the global variable stuff. And then the call fun stuff is accepting an argument stuff 
then it's printing out v and then it's reassigning stuff only inside the scope of the function and then it's going to print out stuff so notice two things here the reassignment of stuff only affects the scope of the stuff variable inside the function and the fun function first checks to see if v is defined at the function scope and if not which is our case it will then search the global scope for the variable names v leading it to print out this global v as a string okay so really take your time with these few lines of code and understand what's happening here really make sure you understand why global v is printed out why we get this reassigned stuff inside function and then even with the reassignment inside of this function since that's only happening at a local level even after I call the function on line 11 when I print out stuff on line 12 I still get back the original global stuff thanks everyone Hello everyone and welcome to part two function exercises. Let's get some practice with functions. What I want you to do is open up the file part two underscore functions underscore exercises dot js which is located under the javascript level two folder. The problems will gradually get harder as you go along. Let's take a quick look at this file and look at the problems. Okay so this is what the exercise dot js file looks like and a lot of these problem statements are sourced from codingbat.com which is a great website for practice problems if you want to get more than what's here in this file. But basically you're going to have a problem, the name of the problem, and it's going to ask you to write a function to take in particular parameters and then give an output. And after the problem statement you'll see an example of what it should look like. So here we can see the sleep in function when it takes in false and false it should output true. And if we keep going down we see something like monkey trouble if monkey trouble function takes in true and true, it should output true, etc. We go down to string times, and it says given a string and some integer, do something with it. So string times, we see it takes in a string, a number, and then outputs that string multiplied as many times as the number shows here. Then we see lucky sum, which is another problem, takes in three numbers, outputs a certain number depending on what's going on. And then finally, we have problem five, which is a speed ticket problem. You get a number and a Boolean value and you either get zero or one or a two. So if we go all the way down, we get this bonus problem, which is make bricks. This is a pretty tricky problem. So if you can't figure this one out, don't worry. That's why it's a bonus. Go ahead and read the problem, see if you can figure it out. But this has to do not so much with JavaScript, but more of just uh, computer science and trying to think like a programmer. Okay, so we'll leave that one as a bonus for you. Go ahead and tackle the other five, and I will see you in the next lecture where we're going to be programming through the solutions. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the solutions lecture for the function exercises from part two. I'm going to hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, here I am at the JavaScript file, and let's start off with problem number one which is actually quite simple, but it may be a little tricky at first. You can do it all in one line. So let's see how we can do this. The basic question here is we want to write a function called sleep in that takes in two Boolean parameters, weekday and vacation. And if the parameter weekday is true, it means it's a weekday. And if the parameter vacation is true, it means we're on vacation. And we want to sleep in if we're on vacation or it's not a weekday. So let's see how we can do that. It's actually quite easy if you remember your comparison operators and logical operators. What we can do is just check that it's not a weekday with an exclamation mark. So we say it's not a weekday or vacation is true. Because remember these are just Boolean values and that's actually all you had to do for this particular function. So that's the solution for sleep in. Check that it's not a weekday or using the two pipe operators that we're truly on vacation, that vacation is true. Next up is a similar problem called monkey trouble. And here we have two monkeys, A and B, and the parameters A smile and B smile indicate if each is smiling. And we're in trouble if they are both smiling or if neither of them is smiling and return true if we are in trouble. So here is an example. If A is smiling and B is smiling, then we are in trouble. If neither of them are smiling, then we are in trouble. If it's one or the other, true, false, then we're not in trouble, false. 
Okay, so how can we do this? Again, this is actually another one-liner. We'll say return. I want to check for the case where they're both smiling. So since these are both booleans, I can just say a smile and b smile. So if that's true and true, then I am in trouble. So that's one case. Or we have to remember the other case. So I can also put the second case in parentheses, where neither of them are smiling, which is going to look almost the same, except in this case, I have these not operators here. And that's the solution in one line right there. So we check the case where they're both smiling or the case where neither of them are smiling. Anything else will just return false. Let's continue on to problem number three. And if you are having trouble with these and did them in multiple lines, don't worry. I'm showing these solutions on purpose because once you've done a lot of programming and you're more of an experienced programmer, these are the type of solutions you're going to be naturally doing. If you still got the question right, but did it in multiple lines, don't worry. If you're just a beginner, that's totally fine as well. As long as it actually works, don't sweat it. Moving along to problem three, string times. So we are given a string and a non-negative integer n. And we want to return a larger string that is n copies of the original string. And we hear, see here some input and output examples. So how can we do this? Well, let's type up some code and show you. I'm going to make a variable called return str. And that's going to be the string that I return. And to start off with, it's just an empty string. And then I'm going to say variable i is equal to 0. And I'll make a while loop, whoops, a while loop that says while i is less than n, the return string that I made is going to add str, which is the actual input string. And then I'm going to increment i. And once that while loop is done, then I just return the return string. And that's all there is to it. So let's review what's actually happening here. I make an empty string. I initialize i to be equal to 0. And then while i is less than n, I'm going to keep concatenating the str, the input string, to the return string. And then I increment i by 1 until I reach n. And after that, this while loop is over. And then I just return the string itself. So hopefully you remember here how to use a while loop and the fact that you can concatenate strings together. Moving along to problem number four. This one's a little more mathematical. In this case, given three numerical values, a, b, and c, return their sum. However, there's a little special rule to it. If one of the values is 13, then it does not count towards the sum. And values to its right also do not count. So for example, if b is 13, both b and c do not count. So if a was 13, then none of the values would count. So here we have function lucky sum. And let's see how we can do this. It's actually just a, essentially a bunch of if statements to check for the various cases. So the first statement, if, I'm going to say if a is equal to 13. Remember, that was the case where if a is equal to 13, then it doesn't count and nothing to the right counts. So right off the bat, if a is equal to 13, I'm going to return 0. And then I'm going to check for the next case. And that next case can be another if statement. If b is equal to 13, return a. And then we can say if c is equal to 13, in that case, return a plus b. And if none of those returns get executed, we could return a plus b plus c. So that's how you can do this with just a bunch of if statements. But let's rewrite this now to use if, else if, and else statements. So I'm going to delete this. You can pause the screen if you want to see this code. It's also the code that's in the solution. But let's show you now with if and else if statements. So if a is equal to 13, 
And I was using double equal sign there just because we assume that we're actually going to get integers, not strings. But if a is uh, triple equal sign to 13, I return 0. Then we have else if. So if b is equal to 13, then I'm going to return a, which makes sense because that's the only one to the left of b. Then we say else if c is equal to 13, then I'm going to return a plus b. And else, so if a is not equal to 13 and b is not equal to 13 and c is not equal to 13, then I just return the sum of all of them, a plus b plus c. And that's how you can do this problem using if, else, if, and else statements. It's up to you which one you want to use. They'll both work the same. Whichever one makes more sense to you is fine. And then finally, problem five, the bonus problem. If you're driving a little too fast, a police officer stops you. And basically what happens here is we have to compute the ticket. And we have some encoded integer values where zero is no ticket, one is a small ticket, and two is a big ticket. And if our speed while we were driving is 60 miles per hour or kilometers per hour or less, the result is zero. If the speed is between 61 and 80 inclusive, the result is one, we get a small ticket. And if the speed is 81 or more, the result is two, we get a big ticket. Unless it's your birthday. And on that day, your speed can be five higher in all cases. So the second input, this false true, that indicates whether or not it is your birthday. Okay, let's actually write some code here. I'm going to start off by with an if statement, and I'm gonna say if it's your birthday, so if is birthday, speed, I'm just right off the bat going to subtract five from it. And then I can say if speed is less than or equal to 60, I return zero. And then I can say, we'll show it with the if statements for now. If the speed is greater than 60, but less than or equal to 80, then I will say return one. And if none of those gets triggered, then I just return two. I'm going too fast overall. So that's how you can do it with just a few if statements. And if you wanted to, you could rewrite these to be an if, else if, and then an else to return to. So this would be the if statement, this would be the else if, and then this would be the else. It's really up to you again, however you want to write them, whatever makes more sense to you. The trick I used for this was basically this very first if statement, which is outside of these last three because it's essentially just saying, okay, if it is your birthday, then the speed is minus five. And that way I can just check against everything except subtract five from it. To me personally, that's what made the most sense logically, but there's tons of solutions for this. So your logic may be totally different than what's here, depending on how you dealt with the is birthday Boolean. So feel free to share in the Q and A forums, your solutions. Finally, we have the bonus make bricks. And for this bonus problem, we wanted to make a row of bricks that is some sort of goal inches long. And we have a number of small bricks that are one inch each and a number of big bricks that are five inches each. We want to return true if it is possible to make the goal by choosing from the given bricks. And this is a little harder than it looks, but it can actually be done without any loops and in a single line. And like I said before, if you can't figure this one out, don't worry. That's why it's a bonus. But let me show you how you could do this all in one line. I'm going to say return. And first I will say, take our goal inches, say mod five greater than or equal to zero has to be true. And the goal inches mod five minus the amount of small bricks has to be less than or equal to zero. And if we come back here, we want small plus five times big to be greater than or equal to the goal. And that's how you can do this line, this is problem all in one line. So let's actually break down what's happening here. 
So remember we want to make bricks. We have a certain number of small bricks that are one inch each and a certain number of big bricks that are five inches each. And we want to make the row that is goal inches long. And what we really want to know is return true if it's even possible to make the goal by choosing from the given bricks. So for example, if we have one small brick and one big brick, we can make one inch, five inch, and six inch goals. But we wouldn't be able to make four inch goals because we don't have enough small bricks and we have just one big brick. So we can't actually make that integral, if you will. So that's kind of the logic behind the solution. So the very first one just checks if the goal mod five is greater than or equal to zero, then that checks for the large bricks. And then we do this. The goal mod five minus the amount of small bricks needs to be less than or equal to zero here. And basically what that means is I need to know that I have enough filler bricks between the counts of five. So between the multiples of five, this checks for the actual filler bricks. And then here, this last case where I say small plus five times big checks that I have the right combination of small bricks and big bricks in order to at least meet or exceed the goal. Okay, so take your time. This one's really tricky to think about. And like I said, it's not so much about general JavaScript syntax. It's more about programming in general. I would recommend that you check out codingbat.com. So if you scroll all the way up here, I mentioned the actual website called codingbat.com. They actually have a full video explanation on how you can get to this one line of code for this make bricks problem. It's kind of a famous problem on the website because it's so tricky and this solution on one line can seem so unintuitive at first. So take your time with it, visit codingbat.com, search for make bricks and you'll find that question along with a full video explanation of this specific solution for it. Okay, thanks everyone. Hope you enjoyed the exercises. Feel free to post to the Q&A forums if you get stuck on anything. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part three, arrays. Arrays are going to allow us to store various basic data types in a sequence so we can then later access them as needed. And this is all best explained through example code so let's get started. I'm going to hop right to my browser and open up the console. All right, so here I have the console open and we wanna know why even bother using arrays? Well, imagine we have three variables that are countries. So I have this var country one and it's equal to the string USA. Then I have var country two. We'll have it be equal to Germany. And then we have var country three, and let's have it equal to China. Now, if we wanted to, we could keep doing this, but instead of having to declare a variable for every single string, it'd be a lot easier if I just had one sort of data structure that could take in the strings themselves and name that whole thing a single variable name. And the way we can do that is through the use of brackets, which create arrays. So I'll, I will instead create a variable called countries and set it equal to an array of those strings. So now I have USA, Germany, and China. And now this saves me a lot of variable assignments. And you could have also formatted this across multiple lines. So you can do something like var countries is equal to USA, comma, and if you hit enter here, you can keep typing Germany, comma, China. So that's sometimes another way that you'll see arrays being constructed, one line per item, but usually uh, it's this first way. It really depends on how many items are in the array, so just keep that in mind. Either of these ways is fine. But that's kind of the whole point of an array. Save yourself the effort of having to define multiple variables. Now let's talk about accessing elements of the array. Each element in this array is in a fixed sequence position, meaning the elements are in order and can be called by their position. So they get placed in order and they stay in order. And indexing, just like a string, starts at zero. So I will clear the console. We still have countries defined here. Whoops, let's try that again. Countries defined, USA, Germany, and China. 
And if I say countries and then use square bracket indexing, I can actually grab items from that array. So let's say I want to grab China. Well, if indexing starts at zero, that's going to be zero, one, two, and that grabs me China there. All right, let's clear this and continue on. So again, this is just like indexing characters from a string. You can also do reassignments. You can reassign elements by accessing their index and then just reassigning it. So if I want to change China to another country, we can grab countries too. That was where China was and set it equal to France. Hit enter. And now when I call countries, I see USA, Germany, and France. Now you couldn't do this sort of reassignment with a string. And that's the difference between something that's immutable and something that's mutable. Okay, so let's visit a little more on this topic of immutability and mutability. And that is just to spell it out for you. That's immutable versus mutable, coming from the word to mutate or to change. So let's clear our console and show you an example. Remember that I right now have countries as USA, Germany, and France. And I could do the reassignment as I did earlier by saying countries, whatever index I wanted to change, and then some other country. So we can make this something like Spain. And now when I visit countries again, I see USA, Germany, Spain. So that means an array is mutable. I can index and reassign. And it's a sequence. However, not every sequence is mutable. So strings are immutable. If I try to do the same action, it won't actually work. So remember, country one is USA. If I try to say country one, grab two, that's going to be equal to A. So country one, grab two is A. Let's try to change it from USA to USB. The same way we did with countries. So I will say country one, two, and I will set it equal to B. If I hit enter here, it just outputs B. But if I actually look at country one to see if anything changed, it didn't. And that's because a string is immutable in this situation. So they're both sequences. We can index the pretty much the exact same way, but the array is mutable and the strings are not. Okay, let's continue on by talking about mixed data types. So a JavaScript array can actually take mixed data types. We showed earlier an array called countries that only had strings in it, but I can make a variable called mixed and it can take in anything. It can take in a Boolean, a number, and a string. And notice here that the syntax highlighting shows these are all three very different data types. And mixed has no problem holding them in. So an array can take in mixed data types. And it will also report back a length. So here we can see we have three items. Calling length in an array just reports back how many elements are in the array. Now let's begin to discuss array methods. So we're going to discuss just some basic methods available to you when you're working with arrays in JavaScript. And there's actually a link in the documentation to the developer.mozilla.org page, and I'm going to go to it now just to show you real quick. I have it open here in a new tab, Array JavaScript, and this says basically everything you'd ever want to know about an array. How to create an array, access stuff, loop over an array, add an end to the array, etc remove from the front of an array. If you scroll all the way down, it has tons and tons of information about arrays. A lot of stuff that we're never gonna really need or use for our use cases in the course, but if you dive deeper into JavaScript and you end up really enjoying that language, you may wanna check out a lot of the stuff here. So again, a great resource, and the link is in the notes, or you can just Google search Mozilla Developer Network JavaScript Array, and it will take you to this page. Coming back to the actual console, let's start with the most basic and useful array methods. So I will clear my console and say variable my array is equal to one, two, three. Now let's talk about adding and removing elements. So to add and remove elements from an array, you use the push and pop methods. Let's start with removing the last item. So to remove the last item and return it as a new variable, you use the dot pop method. So if I want a variable called last item, 
to be the last item in my r, my array, I will set it equal to my r dot pop. Close parentheses here to actually execute the pop method. And now when I check last item, I see it's number three. And if I check my r, I see that I've successfully popped off and removed the last item from my array. If we instead want to add an item to the end of the array, we use the push command. Let's show you how to use that. Very similar feature, except you say my AR, or whatever the name of your array is, you type push, and inside of these parentheses, you type whatever item you want to push to the end of the array. So let's make a string called new item. And now let's check out my array. And we see we have one, two, and new item. And when you push the item, it reports back the length of the array after you push it. So now we have three items in the array, so it reported back three. And if you want, you can also expand this. So in the console, it has a nice little feature here where it says, okay, at index zero, you have one, index one, you have two, index two, you have new item. Length is three, and it has more information here that we'll discuss in a future lecture. Okay, let's say you want to index the last item in the array. Well, that's also really easy. You just say my r brackets, and then it's going to be my r dot length minus one. And this will return the last item. And remember, in this indexing starts at zero, which is why we're doing that minus one. And we can actually nest arrays as well. So I can make a variable called matrix and set it equal to a nested array. So arrays within arrays. So something that looks like this. Four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine. So now if I look at my matrix, I can see I have an array inside of an array where it gets reported back how many items are in that array. But keep in mind, if I check the length of my matrix, it only has three items in it. Each of those items, however, has an additional three items. So keep that in mind when you're checking and working with nested arrays. Now let's talk about array iteration, and that is using things like for loops with an array. Okay, so let's discuss array iteration. Imagine that I have an array, we'll call it V, or we'll call it ARR for array, and it's going to have just three strings in it. It's going to have the letter A, the letter B, the letter C, and that's it. Just three items in the array. And if we check it out, there we have it, A, B, and C. Imagine I want to print out A, B, and C. How could I do that? Well, I could use a normal for loop. So my for loop would look something like this. It would say the variable start I starts at equal to zero, and from I, or while I is less than the length of the array, keep incrementing one to I, and then we will say console.log, the ith elements of that array using indexing. And here's how we can print a, b, and c. Now that's the for loop way of iterating through an array, but there's also the for of statement. So we can say, if we take a look at it, I'm going to clear this so we can get a better look, for, and then in parentheses, some sort of temporary variable name, letter of the array, in our case it's called ARR, do something. So in our case, I will say console.log the letter. And here we get the exact same result. So this is the for of loop that we briefly mentioned during the for loops lecture in the course. So I can say for some temporary variable name of in array, and then we can do something with that temporary variable. And we can call that temporary variable whatever we want. So I can say something like for jelly of the array, console.log jelly, a, b, and c. And we can also do something that's completely unrelated to any elements of the array. So instead of saying console.log jelly, I could just say console.log hello, and that's gonna just write hello three times. So hello, 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 and you can see 
Google Chrome has stated it was written three times. So that is the art of using the for of loop. Now a really common thing that happens when you're dealing with an array is you want to pass each item of that array into a function. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to clear my console. Imagine I want to alert the user to every letter in that array. So I will say for letter of ARR alert letter and then close those curly brackets, hit enter, and I get an alert that says A, B, and C. That sort of thing is so common to use some sort of function for every element in an array that there's actually a shorthand for this, and it's the for each method. What you do is you take the name of your array, and then off of it you call a for each, and then you pass in the function you want to use. In our case, it's the alert function. And note that I just pass in the function itself. I do not call the function like this. So there's no close and open parentheses around the end of the function. It's just the function itself. Now if I hit enter, this does the exact same thing, a, b, and c. So again, calling a function for every element in an array is such a common occurrence that JavaScript already has it built in as a method for arrays, the dot for each method, where that you then just pass in the function itself into the for each method. Let me show you one more example with our own custom defined array, or a function I should say. I'm going to create a function and we'll say add awesome is the name of our function. It takes in a name and then it will console.log the name plus the phrase is awesome. Curly brackets to end that. So what does add awesome do? Well, if I call add awesome on the word Django, it says Django is awesome. So now I will create an array called topics has Python in it, Django in it, and we'll say science in it as well. It's three awesome things. And I'm going to say topics for each and then pass in my function, which in my case was just add awesome. I hit enter and then I see Python is awesome, Django is awesome, and science is awesome. All right, that's really the basics of array. Remember you have the for each method you have the for of method as well for array iteration. You also have the pop and push methods to take things out of an array and add them to an array. You can nest arrays. Arrays can take in mixed types and you can do reassignments for array and you just index arrays with the bracket notation starting at index zero. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums, but coming up next is an exercise to get practice on all of these topics. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to part 4 array exercise. It's now time to practice using arrays in a more realistic situation and we're going to be creating a very simple student roster app using the JavaScript code that we know so far. Go ahead and check out part 4 array exercise.html file, open it up in your browser and read the instructions there. I'm going to hop over to my browser with that file open to explain the actual exercise. Okay, so I have here the HTML file for the exercise open in my browser. And like I mentioned, for this exercise, we're making a very simple web app that contains an array of student names in a JavaScript file using an array. And the website is going to prompt you for four possible commands. Add, remove, display, and quit. So those are things that you're actually going to type in. And this web page will prompt the user for one of these commands. And then here's what each command should do. So add will then create a prompt for a student name request. Then we add this name to the student to the array of the student names in the JavaScript file. Remove will create a prompt for a student name request. Then remove this name from the roster array. Display will print out the roster using console.log and quit will end the while loop of prompts.
So let me actually show you what this would look like. I'm going to refresh this page and run through what this may actually look like. First off, it asks me, would you like to start the roster web app? Y or N, yes or no? I'll enter Y, hit OK. And then it says, please select an action, add, remove, display, or quit. I'm going to add. And what name would we like to add? And we're just going to be worried about single word names, so first names only. I would like to add Jose. And then it says, please select an action, add, remove, display, or quit. So I will say display, and if I hit OK, I can see here in the console that I successfully added Jose to the student roster. Now I'm going to add another name. Let's add Sam. And now let's display the roster again. And I see now I have Jose and Sam in the array in the console. Now let's add one more name. And I will add Frankie. Oops said please select an action, add. Now I would like to add Frankie. And now let's display. I have Jose, Sam, and Frankie. Let's see what remove does. So it says please select an action. I type remove. And then it says what name would you like to remove? I'll remove my name, Jose. Let's display the array. And here we see Sam and Frankie. So I successfully removed Jose. And then to end all of this, I'll just type quit. And it says, thank you for using the web app. Please refresh the page to start over. Hit OK. And that's it. All right. So there is a JavaScript file that actually has a bunch of hints and comments. It's basically a walkthrough guide to help you out with this project. I'm going to take a look at it now. So the file you will want to use and link to your HTML file is called part4 underscore array underscore exercise dot JavaScript. This is a JavaScript file that just has a bunch of comments in it, commented hints. It's optional to use. If you want, you can go straight into the exercise without referencing this JavaScript file at all. But I would recommend that you check out this JavaScript file for the hints and the structure it provides. So again, this is available to you. It basically tells you what to do. So for instance, we've already created a roster for you, the variable roster, and we want you to create functions for the task. So add a new student. Create a function called add new that takes in a name, uses dot push to add a new student to the array. Then the remove student. And we actually have a hint here on Stack Overflow. We haven't shown you how to write a function called remove that takes in a name and then finds its index location, then removes it from the roster. So there's a link to here to Stack Overflow that will tell you how to remove a particular element from an array. Then we have display roster. Just create a function called display that prints out the roster to the console. That should be pretty easy. It's console.log basically. And then start by asking if they want to use the web app, yes or no. And now at the very bottom, this is where all your logic is going to go. Create a while loop that keeps asking for an action, add, remove, display, or quit. And then use if and else if statements to execute the correct functions that we created above for each of those commands. All right, if you have any questions on this, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. You can always check out the JavaScript solutions if you get stuck on something, or just hop straight to the next lecture where I'm going to be coding through the solutions to this exercise. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part four, array exercise solution. And in this lecture, we're going to be coding through the solution for that student roster array exercise project. Let's head over to the editor and get started. Okay, so here I am with the JavaScript part four array exercise file open. Let's start off by actually creating the functions. The first one we needed to create was the add new function for adding a new student. So we'll call the keyword function and we can just get it by typing fun, hitting enter, and we will say add new. And add new will not take any parameters. Instead, what we're going to do is create a variable inside of add new called new name and we will prompt the user for what name would you like to add, question mark. And then once we get that new name, we're going to push it to the roster. So we'll grab roster, push, and then push in that new name. And that's all there really is for adding the new student. Now let's talk about removing the student. And this is actually quite a bit trickier, and you definitely have to visit this Stack Overflow link 
if you're going to do it the same way I do it right now. And that Stack Overflow link basically has the answer of removing a particular element from an array. So again, we'll create a function. We'll call it remove. And I'm going to say a variable. We'll call it rem name for remove name. And we'll ask what name would you like to remove? Question mark. And then I'm also going to create a variable called index. And this is going to be roster dot, and the method here is index of, and that was in the stack overflow link there. So roster dot index of rem name. And then the other thing from the stack overflow was the splice method. And the splice method takes in index comma one where one is just how many elements we want to delete starting at this index. And that's all there is for the remove function. Let's continue on with the next one. The next thing we want to do is display roster. So that one's actually quite simple. It's basically just logging the roster. So we're going to say function display. Doesn't take any arguments, but we will just log the actual roster. Now it's time for basically the hard part, which is actual all, actually programming all that logic. So I'm going to create a couple more lines here just so I can see everything clearly. We're going to start off by creating two variables called start. And start is just a prompt that says, would you like to start the roster web app? And we'll only accept Y or N, so we'll tell the user Y or N there. And I will also create a variable called request that is equal to empty. And we'll see what request for is in just a second, but basically it's going to be a string. And I'm going to say if start is equal to Y, meaning the user did want to start the web app, while request is not equal to quit, I'm going to do the following. I'll ask for a new request by prompting them. Please select an action. Add, remove, display, or quit. And here is where I'm actually going to start testing for stuff, all inside this while loop. So if the request was equal to add, well in that case I'm going to call add new. And add new has the prompt asking for the new name and pushing it to the roster. So all I have to do is call add new, nothing else. Else if request is equal to display. That's quite easy too. I just call display. And then else if, let's say request is equal to remove. Well, in that case, I just call the remove function that I created earlier. And if we scroll all the way down, we can see the rest of these brackets to make sure they're all balanced. And I'm going to have an alert here that says, thanks for using the web app. Please refresh to start over. And as a quick note, I don't have an else statement here. I technically don't really need one for this entire thing to work. And the reason for that is because they're all within the while loop here. But something I could do is say else and then just have it be quit. So say request is equal to quit. And basically what this does is if request is not add, remove, display, or quit, so maybe the person types something wrong, it will automatically quit. So we probably also want to say an alert here, not recognized. will quit. 
or we could just say not recognized and then comment this out. And then we'll continually ask for the prompt here. All right, so that's really all you had to do. Let's actually run this and make sure it worked. I'm going to open up my browser. Okay, here's my browser. I've refreshed the page. It says, would you like to start the web app? I will say yes. Please select an action. Let's add something. We'll add Jose. Let's display to make sure it worked. There's Jose. Let's add one more. We'll add in Sammy. Display. Jose and Sammy are there. Let's remove Sammy. And now let's display again. There's Jose. And then let's try just typing some random. And it says not recognized. Great. That's exactly what we wanted. And then we will quit. And it says, thanks for using the web app. Please refresh to start over. Okay, so that's it. Looks like everything worked correctly. Thanks, everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part five, objects. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about JavaScript objects. And JavaScript objects are essentially hash tables. They store information in a key value pair. In other programming language, this is sometimes known as a dictionary. And unlike an array, a JavaScript object will not retain any sort of order. The name object can sometimes be confusing if you're coming in from another programming language because it sounds so generic. But keep in mind, when someone says JavaScript object, they're talking about a very specific thing. Now the typical JavaScript object is in this form. It's inside curly brackets, and then you have the key colon, and then the actual value that's associated with that key. And you then access values through the corresponding key. All right, let's hop to the console and see some actual examples of this so we can learn more about JavaScript objects. I'm going to hop to my browser now. OK, here I am at my browser with the console open. And as a quick note, the Mozilla Developer Network has a great page on working with objects, has a great overview, talks about object properties, and the various methods you can work with an object. And there's also a page in w3schools.com on JavaScript objects. And what's really common when you're working with objects for the very first time is a car object, where you have different aspects of a car inside of an object. So we can see it's actually here on both pages. So let's continue that trend by creating our first object to be some information about a car. And we'll call it car info. And I've actually written this previously, which is why you see it pop up here. But I'm going to make a variable called car info start with a curly bracket, and then the first key I'll have is the make of the car. And the make of the car is going to be Toyota. Then the next key I have is going to be year. And it's 1990, so we can already see that a JavaScript object can take in mixed data types. And then finally, I'll have the model of the car, and that will be the string Camry. And then we've closed this all off with another curly bracket, Hit enter, and there we have it. So if I call car info now, I see I have a make Toyota year 1990, and the model is Camry. If I actually want to get a value back, so the values are Toyota 1990 or Camry, I have to call the corresponding key. So instead of indexing, like we did with an array, I will actually pass in the key. So if I want the make of the car, it looks like this, and then I get back Toyota. Something to keep in mind, especially if you're used to Python, is that by convention for JavaScript objects, the keys don't have quotes around them when you're building out the object itself. So you can see here, make, year, and model won't have any quotes around them, so they're not strings. But when you're calling the actual key value pair, you do have to pass in strings. Otherwise, if you were to just call car info and then call make in this manner with it not being a string, JavaScript is going to get confused because it thinks you're actually referencing some variable called make earlier. So keep that in mind. When you're creating the actual object by convention, you're not going to have a string here. But you also need, when you're actually calling the key value pair, a string here. All right. So that's just a point of confusion sometimes for beginners or people coming in from Python programming. So keep that in mind. I'm going to clear this to show another example. JavaScript objects are really flexible with the data types they can take in. So we can make 
my new, let's say my new O for my new JavaScript object. And we'll say A has a string. So here's a key value pair, A hello. We'll say the key B has an array, one, two, three. And then finally we can say key C has a JavaScript object inside of it. So we're nesting it. And we can say something like inside and then A, B. And let's make sure we actually balance out these brackets. And here we have my new O, so let's check it out. And it's a JavaScript object. And notice when we actually print this out, it says O. For the key C, we have this other object. And then I can expand this and keep checking stuff out here. Okay, let's practice actually grabbing some stuff here. So the first thing I want to try to grab is hello. And pause the video, see if you can grab hello on your own. Okay, I'm going to do it now. Well, that's pretty easy. I just pass in the string A here, and it retrieves hello. Now see if you're able to get the number 2 out of this my new O. Okay, let's try it out. I get my new O. First thing I want to do is actually grab B. And then I can see I have the array out. So I can actually, if I press up on my key, stack the calls, these indexing calls or these key calls. And if I want the number 2, well, that's at index 1. Remember, 0 is the starting index. And there I have it. There's the number 2. Now let's try to get the letter B from this very last object. So I call my new O. I have to grab the key C to begin with. Then I have to grab the key inside. And then finally, I have to grab the second item at index 1, which is the letter B. If I hit enter, let's see if I got this right. There it is, the letter B. So take your time. Make sure you can understand each of these steps for grabbing something that's nested inside of a JavaScript object. Now, as a quick note, it's definitely not that common to have something this nested. This is a pretty extreme example, but just keep that in mind, the capability that you can have objects within objects. All right, let's move along and talk about actually changing values that correspond to a key. I'm going to clear my console and let's go back to car info that we had earlier. Remember, that's just make year and model. If I wanted to change the car year, all I have to do is grab car info and then pass in the key I want to change. In this case, it's year and set it equal to some new value. So for instance, we can make it 2006. And now when I call car info, I can see that I successfully changed the year of my car. Okay, we can also use a reference to the object itself. So I can do something like this, car info, year, and then say plus equals one. And that will also work to turn back 2007. And if I call car info, I see it's 2007 now. So that works when your value is an actual uh, number. You can edit it that way. If we want to show an entire object, this is sometimes different by browser. So to show you what I mean, I'm going to clear this. Sometimes for some browsers, if you just pass in the object itself, it won't actually show you the entire object. But if you really want to make sure that you show the entire object, you can call console.dir and then pass in your object here. So we pass in car info and we see we have the object itself and then you can expand this to see the different keys and the value pairs. Now for this pretty small object, we basically got the same thing in our console. So keep in mind that if for some reason you're working with a different browser and you have a very large object that you're not able to see the entire thing, you can always call console.dir and then pass in your JavaScript object to make sure you see the entire thing and expand it. All right, continuing on, let's talk about iterating through an object. So to iterate through an object, you can actually use a for in. And let me show you what that looks like. You say for, and then you make up some temporary variable. So I'm going to say for key in, and then you pass in your object. In my case, it's car info. Open curly brackets. And a quick thing to remind you is there is no specific order to a JavaScript object. So even though I can iterate through it with a for loop, I have no guarantees about what order I'm going to grab stuff in. Sometimes year may come out first, sometimes model may come out first, sometimes make may come out first. Uh, so keep that in mind, there's not going to be any specific order. 
continuing on, let's show you how to grab keys. So this is going to grab the keys. I'm going to do a console.log of the key itself. And then close that bracket. So I see here for key in car info, console.log key. And just to quickly note, I could have called key here anything. This is just a temporary variable. So I could call this jelly as well. It doesn't have to be the actual word key. So if I say for jelly in car info, I still get all the keys out. Now usually when you're programming, you want to use some sort of variable name that makes sense. So obviously jelly is not a good idea, but maybe something simple like K is a good fit here. So if I'm actually able to use this for in loop to grab the keys, it means I can grab items as well, or those actual values. So let's show you how to do that. I'll just say console.log, and then inside of this, I can call car info, and then access at that key. Let's show that. And here we see make Toyota year 2007 model Camry. And that's just by doing car info at that key. All right, that's all we're going to discuss right now for this first part of JavaScript objects. In the next part of part five objects, we're going to discuss object methods. Let's quickly review what we've covered so far. JavaScript objects are key value pairs. You have a key and then you have a value that corresponds to that key. If you want to actually grab something, you can use bracket notation to do it. So again, if I clear my console here, I can say the name of my object and in square brackets, pass in a string that corresponds with whatever key I'm interested in. So in this case, if I'm interested in grabbing the make, I get back that key value pair. And then if we want to actually iterate through a JavaScript object, well, I can just use this for in. And I grab the keys here with my temporary variable name. And if I want to grab the actual value that corresponds to that key, well, then I just make the call with the variable name inside of this for loop. And that's really all you need to know about objects at this time. Coming up next, we're going to discuss a really cool feature of JavaScript objects, which are object methods. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the continuation of part five, JavaScript objects. Let's continue by discussing object methods. Object methods are essentially functions that are inside of an object. For example, imagine we have our car info object from the previous lecture. We have the make year and model, and then we actually input a function there as the value for a key. So the key is car alert, and the value there is an actual function call. And the function call just says, alert, we've got a car here. And then we can actually call that method off of the car info object, meaning we can actually call methods off objects and they essentially act as functions inside of an object. Now more realistically, what you're going to want to do is use key value pairs from the object itself. And in that case, you're going to need to use the special this keyword. And the this keyword can be confusing for beginners at first. So don't worry if you don't immediately fully grasp it. We're going to be seeing it when we talk about jQuery. But again, coming back to the previous example, here, my function doesn't actually use any information that pertains to the object. It doesn't use the make, year, or model. It's just a function that gives a basic alert. But imagine I want to actually use some of those key value pairs from the object itself. Well, the this keyword acts differently depending on the situation. For a JavaScript object, the this keyword is set to the object the method is called on. Let me show you an example of what I mean by that. Imagine I have this very simple object where it just has one singular property, and that is the number 37. If I wanted a function called report prop, or a, I should say a method called report prop inside of my object, then I call report prop function, and it returns this dot prop, where this is acting as a reference to the actual object. And then if I were to say something like console.log my object dot report prop with the call, it would log 37 into the console screen. All right, here's a really good link for more details on the this keyword. Again, it behaves differently in different situations and we're only really concerned about it right now as it behaves in an object in reference to methods. So let's code out a few more examples of object methods to get a better grasp on everything that I just briefly mentioned. 
I'm going to hop over to the console now. All right, here I am at the actual console. Let's create a very simple object. We'll call it the variable simple. And it's going to be an object with a property. We'll call it prop. And that property is, we'll say, hello. And then it's going to have a method inside of it. And we'll call this method my method, just to make it very clear everything that's going on here. And then I use the function keyword, close parentheses, so it doesn't actually have any parameters there. And then I'm going to say alert. Actually, let's make this a console.log. And it's going to console log the my method was called. And then let's close off these parentheses here. So there is simple. So again, simple is an object. And note when I actually show simple, it doesn't display the methods. It just displays object with the single property, that key value pair, prop hello. If I say console.dir and then pass in simple, there I see an object that I can continue to expand to see my method and that property. Again, you could have also continued to expand up here, but that's just a simple note, depending on what browser you're using, you may find it easier to say console.dir. Anyways, back to actually learning how to use this method. If I want to call the method, I just say simple dot and then call my method. And if I call my method here without any closed parentheses and hit enter, then it just reports back the actual method inside of the object. Just like when we were calling functions, we need to actually have an open set and closed set of parentheses on it. That way it can execute the function, which means I will call dot my method, close parentheses, and here it says the my method was called. Perfect, that's exactly what we expected. So again, just a review, here I have the property, there it is with the key value prayer, and here I have my method, we do a function call, and then inside these curly brackets, whatever we want to actually execute whenever we call that method off of this function. Now let's see how we can use actual properties that are already in the object inside of my method. So I'm going to clear this. All right, so to show the use of the this keyword, I'm going to create a new variable and we'll call it my obj for my object and we'll set it equal to an object. The object is going to just have one property. We'll say it's the name and the name is going to be Jose or you can just fill in whatever name you want there. And then let's actually give it a method. And we'll call this method greet, where we actually greet whosoever name is in my object here. So I have greet, and I'm going to call the function keyword, curly brackets. And then here I'm going to say console.log. And I want to say hello. And then concatenate the name in my object. And the way I do this is by using the this keyword. I call this dot, and then I actually pass in whatever property I want, the key to that value pair. And in that case, it's going to be name. So I say this dot name, and it refers to the current object I'm in, whatever property that is. And that's how we can actually create a method that uses properties of the object we are currently in. So what we need to do now is actually close off and balance off these uh, brackets here. Let's make sure that worked. Let me hit enter there. Okay, perfect. And then I'm going to call my object. It's an object with a name. If I wanna see that name, I could also just say name, Jose. And now let's check to see if it actually worked when I call greet. So I will call greet. And remember, just like a function, if I don't have open and close parentheses here, hit enter, nothing's gonna occur. So I need to open and close those parentheses to actually execute this. And it says, hello, Jose. So I forgot to put a little space after hello. So let's fix that. I'm gonna come back up here. There's my object. Let's fix that by putting a space in there. And now let's call my object greet again. And then I see, hello, Jose. Okay, and that's really the basics of object methods as far as we need to know them. 
Again, the main thing to get out here is that an object method is essentially just like a function call inside of a key value pair. And if you want to use the properties of the current object you're in, all you have to do is use the this keyword and syntax highlighting will show you that it's a keyword and then you say dot and then whatever the property name you want to use in. Okay, so hopefully you have a better understanding now of how objects actually work in JavaScript, how to create methods inside of an object, and how to use the this keyword. Coming up next is an exercise to review everything we learned about JavaScript objects. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part six, objects exercise. So for this exercise, check out the file part six underscore objects underscore exercise .js, which is under the JavaScript level two folder. It contains three objects along with tasks that involve you adding methods to each of these objects. Let's take a quick look at this file and what you have to do. Okay, so this is what the file looks like. It has three problems, which have three basic objects. You're given an object that looks like this for the first one, and then we want you to add a method called name length that prints out the, the length of an employee's name to the console. And then for problem two, you're given the same object, this employee object with a name, job, and age, and we want you to write a program that will create an alert in the browser of each of the object's values for the key value pairs. So for example, it should alert name is John Smith, job is programmer, age is 31. So remember the use of the this keyword in order to solve this. And then back to problem three, the very last one, we just want you to add a method called last name that prints out the employee's last name to the console. And for this, you're going to have to do a little bit of research because Notice the name comes as just a single string with a space in between. And you're going to need to figure out how to split a string to an array. And there's a hint here, a link to W3Schools where they show you how to do that. All right, those are the three problems, pretty simple. I'll see you at the next lecture where we actually code through the solutions. Hello everyone and welcome back to part six object exercise solutions. Where we're going to be coding through the solutions for the previous exercises. Let's hop over and get started. Okay, for the first problem, what we had to do was actually console log the length of this name. So how can we do that? Well, first we need to create a method. I'll call the method name length. And then what I'm going to do is call the function and then have these set of curly brackets here and I will console log and then I'm going to say this dot name dot length. And we didn't see an exact example of this, of calling another property off the initial key value pair property, but hopefully you're able to figure this out. So again, this refers back to employee or current object. Then we have name, which is this property right here. And then I want to grab the length of that name which I say with dot length. And that is how you grab the length off of this name. Let's go down to problem number two. In problem number two, we wanted to write a program that will create an alert in the browser of each of the object values and the key value pairs. So for example, it should alert, my name is John Smith, job is programmer, age is 31. So I'll call this method report. We call the function. It won't have a name and then I say alert and I'm going to say name is and then let's concatenate everything we need. We want this dot name and then I also want to whoops concatenate comma job is and then I want to say this dot job and then I'm going to concatenate with comma age is, and then I will concatenate that with this dot age. And that's all you had to do for this one. It's basically a bunch of this calls. So again, this employee, and then grab the actual properties, name, job, and age, and concatenate that all into a single alert call. All right, finally, the last problem, problem number three, which was add a method called last name that prints out the employee's last name to the console. This one was a little bit trickier because you had to figure out how to split a string to an array in order to just grab this right here. Let's show you how we can do that. 
case you weren't able to figure it out. I'll create a method called last name, type in function, and then what I'm going to do is say console.log, and I will grab this dot name. And what you had to do is you had to figure out you can call dot split on a string, and then as a parameter to that dot split method, you can pass in whatever you want to split on. And I want to split on a blank space here between the first and last name. And then after that, that returns an array. So I will index for the second item in the array, which is the last name, at index one. And that's how you can create a method that prints out the employee's last name. So again, just to quickly review this one, this becomes the actual object we're in right now, called the dot name property, and that's the string John Smith. I'm going to I'm going to take John Smith and then call split, and I pass in an empty string here. Well, it's not empty, so there's space there because I want to split on the space, and that returns an array of two items, the first name and the last name, John and Smith, and I want to grab the second item at index one, which is Smith, and that's the last name. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed those and you were able to figure them all out. If you had a little bit of trouble with them, don't worry about it too much. We'll get more practice later on in the course. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next section. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Document Object Model section of the course. In this section, we're going to be learning about the Document Object Model, or DOM, DOM, and the Document Object Model is going to allow us to interface our JavaScript code to directly interact with HTML and CSS on a web page. So far, we've already learned and have a pretty good understanding of the three main front-end technologies. That's HTML for the website content, CSS for the styling of that content, and then JavaScript, which can interact with the website, HTML, and CSS, and actually manipulate what you see on the page. What we actually don't know how to do yet is how to really connect that JavaScript with HTML and CSS. How can we use JavaScript to directly interact with the HTML and CSS and change what the user is actually seeing? Well, browsers will construct the document object model, which basically means storing all the HTML tags as JavaScript objects. And let me show you a very simple example of this. Imagine I have some very basic HTML over here on the left-hand side. I have a head, a title, which is just my title, and in the body, I have a heading one and then an anchor tag website link. And then right below that on the left-hand side is what this would look like in the browser. It would just be a heading and then some link text there. When I upload this in my browser, what happens is my browser creates this document object model. And we can already see how this looks like a JavaScript object. So I have the root element, the HTML, the head, the title, the text, and I can actually grab things from this document object model using JavaScript. So we can see the DOM or DOM of any website. So you can go to a website and in the console type document to see the actual document object model. And we're going to be doing that in this lecture later on. And that will return the HTML text of the page. To see the actual objects, you wanna use console.dir and then pass in document. This document object model will allow us to use JavaScript to actually interact with the web page and affect the HTML and CSS on the web page. Now keep in mind, the document object model is enormous. It has tons of properties, it's a huge object, but most developers won't use all the properties, not even close to all the properties. But we're going to be covering the most common objects used, and I want you to be prepared for the unknown. When you first see the document object model, it's going to seem really intimidating, and there's all these properties, and you'll feel like there's no way you'll ever have to be able to memorize all of them. And that's not really the point. You don't have to memorize all of them. What you have to do is have an understanding of how it works. That way, when you need something that you haven't encountered yet, you have the capability to reference it on your own and look for help on your own. So let's continue by actually exploring this idea in the browser. And afterwards, in the next lecture, we're going to go through an example of using JavaScript with the document object model. So let me hop over to my browser and kind of show you realistically what the heck I've been talking about. Okay, so here I am at Instagram.com. You can really choose any website for this exercise or this example. And hopefully now you can kind of see based off just what Instagram looks like at this moment in time, uh, you probably already have the abilities to mock up something that looks pretty similar to this just with HTML, CSS, and Bootstrap. You already know how to create forms, how to create nav bars, etc. But let's continue on and talk about the actual thing we came here for, which is the document object model. What you can do, and you can do this on any page, doesn't have to be Instagram, right click, then hit inspect, and then come to the console. And what you're going to do is just 
clear the console. You may have some messages here depending on what website you're visiting. Don't worry about them, just clear the console. And let's explore the document object model. Now if I just type in the variable document and hit enter, I will actually get as an output the HTML that's on this page. So I can see here there's a body and I can keep expanding this to uh, end up seeing some scripts. Maybe I want to see these divs, etc. Eventually I'll see the forms, but that's not actually what we want to see. What we want to see is this entire document, so all the HTML and its properties as a JavaScript object. And to do that, I can say console.dir and then pass in the document. I'll hit enter and now I see document. And if I expand it, I get what looks like and basically is a JavaScript object where I have all these various properties and their values. And here I can actually then using JavaScript grab properties from this web page and then edit their values to actually create changes that appear to the user on the front end. And that's basically the idea behind the document object model. This is what's going to allow you to use JavaScript to actually manipulate what the user sees on the web page. And this is going to be the big leap forward for us to end our understanding of how the front end actually works. So far we have all the puzzle pieces, but we haven't really put them together. The document object model is what's going to allow us to put them all together and actually see how the front end fully collaborates with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, making that powerful front end stack really shine and really work. Okay, so that's all I want to cover for this lecture. In the next lecture, we're actually going to show you an example of how you can affect this document object model using JavaScript. All right, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to part one, DOM interaction. And in this lecture we'll use JavaScript to actually interact with DOM elements. So as I mentioned, we're going to begin to see examples of how we can actually grab HTML elements from the document object model. And these HTML elements are the properties of that JavaScript object, which is the document. So we're going to be covering how to grab large groups of elements, like the entire body of the HTML, or just the head of the HTML, and then we'll focus on grabbing specific HTML items. Maybe you're interested in just grabbing a certain class or a certain ID, and in future lectures we'll show you how you can interact with those objects. So right now we're just focusing on grabbing those elements themselves. In future lectures we'll show you how to change their colors or affect their properties somehow. Okay, here are some important document attributes. So you can call document and say .url body .head .links. So .url, that's actually going to return the actual URL of the website. .body, that's everything inside the body. It's going to return the HTML of the entire body. Document.head is going to return everything that's in the head of the page. And then .links, those are all the links that are on the page. And there are many methods for grabbing specific elements from the document object model. And these methods are usually pretty self-explanatory, except for those last two. But first off, let's start off with get element by ID. So get element by ID, that returns an element with whatever ID you pass in. So imagine that your HTML has a specific ID that you clarified earlier when creating the HTML, saying document.getElementById will actually grab those elements. Well, usually ID is a single element by the ID you pass in. Then you can get element by class name, so pass in a class, and it'll return a list of all items belonging to that class. Then document.getElementById returns a list of all elements of a certain tag. So if you want everything that has an anchor tag, you can do that as well. Then we have query selector and query selector all. They're a little more new than the previous three, but they're still pretty well used now, depending uh, when you actually are viewing this. But the query selector returns the first object matching the CSS style selector. And then query selector all returns all objects matching the CSS style selector. And we're going to show examples of query selector and query selector all since we're going to be using those a lot. So again, the first three there are pretty self-explanatory, but the query selector can accept any CSS style selector. So you can use things like the hashtag to clarify it's an ID or the dot if you want a class. So basically anything for CSS that you used as a style selector, you can just pass it directly into query selector. And if that's unclear to you now, don't worry, I'll show plenty of examples as we move along. But again, the difference between query selector and then query selector all is that query selector all returns a list of all matches, query selector just returns the first match. 
Okay, the relevant files for this particular lecture are part one, main page.html, and part one, colorchanger.js. We're going to start off by disconnecting the HTML file from colorchanger.javascript and exploring it a bit manually. Then we're going to code out a complex example, which is actually going to be colorchanger.js. All right, let's explore these various methods and get started by opening up those two files in the editor and linking them to our browser. Okay, so here I have part one main page HTML open in my editor, and I also have it open in my browser on the right hand side. And something you notice that's probably pretty interesting to you is that the heading one is randomly changing color. And you're probably wondering how the heck is that happening? Well, in this lecture, we're going to actually code out the example that creates that effect in order to begin explaining how we can grab elements from the document object model and then affect them using JavaScript. But what we're going to do to start off is in part one underscore main underscore page, scroll all the way down and you should see the connection to the part one color changer .js script. What I want you to do is comment this out to begin with, save it, and then refresh the connection page and you should see it just turn to black. What we're going to be focusing on right now is grabbing those common document attributes and then showing the various methods we have to grab HTML elements. So let's get started on that. I'm going to expand my browser and start off by exploring these points right here, which we also covered in the slide. So what's nice about this HTML file is it's basically notes for what we're going to be doing. I'm going to right click, hit inspect, and then open up the console. And your console is probably not gonna be as zoomed in as mine because this is just for readability. Let's show you how to grab important document attributes. If you wanna grab the actual URL of the website, you pass document and then all caps URL and this returns the URL of the website. In my case, stuff is being hosted locally, so I just get the file location. If you wanna grab everything inside the body, you can say document.body, hit enter, and then you can see here we actually have HTML code, which is the entire body. And if we wanna grab everything in the head, we just say document.head, and notice these are attributes, not methods, so I'm not putting any closed parentheses after them. We can expand this and check out the head of the document. And finally, if there are links on the page, in our case, there are no links, but if you wanted to get a list of all the links, you would use document.links. Here again, an empty list because there are no links on that page. Now let's move on to some of these more important methods. Well, not more important, but probably more useful. The get element by ID, and then the query selector family of elements. Let's clear this console. If we want to actually grab elements by ID, we can use the get element by ID method. But first off, let's go back to the HTML and actually give an ID to one of these HTML elements. So let's give this list item, the very first list item that says document.url, I'm going to give it an ID of pick me. We'll save it. And then let's also add a class in here somewhere. Let's give both unordered lists a class of my ul and we'll also give this one a class equal to my ul so my ul my ul there's a two classes and then we have one instance of the pick me id i'm going to save this and then i'll actually refresh my page to make sure those changes are loaded up here and then let's show you how we can grab these elements with the document object model using the methods we just described so i expand this again and then what I'm going to be doing here is off the document, I will say get element by ID, and then I pass in the ID I want. And remember my ID, if I look back at the actual HTML, is just pick me. So let's type that in, pick me. We hit enter and we see here the HTML. It's a list item, has ID pick me, and then it says document URL. This is the actual URL of the website. So if we come back up here, it's actually highlighted when I hover over it, which is kind of nice that Chrome's kind of helping you out here and pointing out what you actually grabbed. So that's how you can grab an element by ID. And then if we want to grab by a class name, we say elements by class name. We can see it kind of auto-completes there. And remember the class name we created was my UL. And then we get back what is essentially kind of acting like a list or an array. It's not quite a JavaScript array, so keep that in mind, but it acts very similar to it. If we expand this, we see we have essentially this HTML collection of these two unordered lists, and those have a bunch of properties themselves. 
And later on, we're going to see how we can actually grab those properties and affect them. But I'm going to collapse this for right now. So we were able to grab elements by ID, elements by class name. And if you wanted to grab elements by the tag name, you probably guessed that already, but you just say document dot get elements by tag name and then input the tag you want. So if I want all the list elements, I just pass in li and then those are all the list elements. And you're also given awareness that one of these has an ID attached to it. Now let's talk about query selector and query selector all, which are not quite as obvious as the ID class name and tag name methods. Query selector is really similar as far as grabbing HTML elements, but what differentiates it from the by ID, by class name, or by tag name is it actually uses the CSS style selector. So it saves you a bunch of time. And let me show you what I actually mean by CSS style selector. If I clear this, I'm going to grab my document, say query selector, and then what I'm going to actually do here is pass in a query selector for a CSS selector. So I will say hashtag pick me. I hit enter and I get the ID pick me. So just like you would if you had a CSS file attached to the HTML and you wanted to affect an ID, you would call the CSS style selector, hashtag for the ID and then the ID name. The query selector actually allows you to grab things by that CSS style selector. So that makes your life a lot easier. And now you don't actually need to even use by ID, by class name, by tag name. You can do everything with query selector and query selector all. So let's imagine I wanted to grab all the li tags. Well, I could just say document query selector. Well, let's say query selector all. I pass in li, hit enter, and I get the exact same thing as if I had done it by class name or excuse me, if I had done it by tag name, if I wanted to do it by class name, well, I would say document and then query selector all, oops, not query command, query selector all, and then pass in the class. But remember for CSS style selectors, a class has a dot. So we say dot and then the class name, which was my UL, hit enter, and we get back the exact same thing we previously got when we said get elements by class name. And hopefully now you get the idea that all you have to do with query selector and query selector all is pass in the actual CSS selector tag. And that saves you a lot of time for typing and it just makes the whole process a little more clear. And as I previously mentioned, the difference between query selector and query selector all is that query selector all returns all the objects matching the CSS style selector. Query selector just returns the very first object. So for instance here, I see document query selector all dot my ul returns two instances of that class. Let's say I just wanted to grab the first one. Well, then I could say document query selector dot my ul and that will just return the very first instance of this class on the HTML page. So that's the main difference between query selector all and query selector. Okay, so we've covered how to actually grab the objects. Let's show a very simple example of how to interact with those objects and change their properties. Let's imagine I want to change the color of the header. Well, the first thing I need to do is actually grab the header. So I will create a variable. We'll call it my header. And I'm going to set it equal to document.querySelector and then pass in the CSS selector. In this case, it's just the very first instance of heading one. I hit enter, and if I check out my header, I get back h1. It has some sort of style call saying it's color black. Most likely yours just says this is the header. I've already manipulated it before, but here we have the header, the HTML. Now let's change the actual color. So in this case, I need to say my header dot, and you'll notice we have a ton of attributes available for this header object or heading object. First one we're going to mess around with is style. So then I will say style, and as you scroll down, you're going to see a lot of the things we learned about during the CSS section of the course, things like the border width, things like the color, um, other things such as font properties, height, etc., margin. But let's keep it simple. Let's just grab the color. And if I want to change it, all I have to do is set this equal to 
some other value. So for instance, let's change it to red. I hit enter here, and now up here on the website page, I can see this is the header has been turned red. And that's the basic fundamental idea of actually grabbing things from the document object model and then affecting them in some manner, changing their properties. And that's really how the front end stack works. You have HTML and CSS, and then JavaScript can use the DOM to go in and grab things. And later on, we'll show you much more advanced methods, such as performing those actions or interactions on clicks or when you hover over text. But the fundamental idea behind everything is that you're grabbing things from the document object model and then interacting with them or changing their properties in some way. Now let's actually show you how we can create that random color generator in the JavaScript file. So I will come back here to this HTML page right here, and all the way down, I'm going to connect it back to part one color changer script, save it, and if you come over to the JavaScript, so let's expand this a little more so we can get a good look at it. We have some examples of what we just did, grabbing that header, changing that style color, but let's show you how we could actually create the random color changing. And I'm just gonna walk through this code because it's essentially a little too complex for us at this moment in time, but later on you can always come back to this and you probably will understand it completely. In fact, right now you should know enough JavaScript that you're able to read this. But let's say I wanted to get a random color function. So every second I change something to a random color. Well, the first thing I need to do is figure out how do I get a random color using JavaScript? And for that, you will probably use Stack Overflow. And I actually linked the Stack Overflow that answers that question. So for me personally, I'm not dealing with JavaScript as often as I would like. I'm usually dealing with Python more. So if I'm forgetful of how to actually grab a random color, I would start Google searching. And if you Google search this, you'll eventually come up to this Stack Overflow link, which is right here for you. And someone has been nice enough to place the actual answer of a random color generator in JavaScript. So we can just copy and paste this code and put it in our script. And basically what this is doing, we can see we have letters, we have some hex code, and it's saying for i is equal to zero all the way i less than six, it's going to somehow grab a series of random letters and then put them in front of the hashtag, and that's making hex codes for us, and it's returning that hex code. So all this is doing is it's making random hex codes for us. So then we create this simple function for clarity. We say function, change header color. We say the color input is get random color. So again, that's just returning a random hex code. And then I'm saying header.style.color is equal to the color input, that random hex code that we just created. And then I'm going to perform that action over a set of intervals. And this is some JavaScript code for actually performing some JavaScript function over a set of certain intervals, in our case, milliseconds. So all I'm saying here is every 500 milliseconds, call this function right here, change header color. So now if I save this and I come back to my actual page over here, my main page, and I refresh, I see now that I'm changing the color randomly every half a second. And that's the main fundamental idea behind the document object model and the interaction. Now what we're going to cover is many more methods and many more details about this process and how to go through it in future lectures in this section of the course. And then later on, we'll show you jQuery, which kind of also simplifies this entire process for you. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two, content interaction. In this lecture, we're going to be seeing more examples of how to interact with the HTML from the document object model. We'll show you how to do things such as change text, change the HTML code, and affect the attributes. The relevant files for this lecture are part two content.html, that's the actual file I'll have open in my browser, and part two interact.js, that's just a copy of all the commands I'll be inputting into the console. Let's get started by opening up part two content.html in our browser. All right, so here I have the HTML document open, and what we're going to be doing is showing you how to change the text, HTML content, and attributes with the actual DOM. So imagine that you've used query selector to actually select an element from the document object model, and you call that variable my variable. Then you could use some of these methods to actually affect it or interact with it. So we could call my variable dot text content, and that returns the actual text. So you could set that equal to some new text if you wanted to change the text of whatever HTML variable you were messing around with. 
Or if you wanted to actually affect the HTML and have effects on things such as the strong tags or the emphasis tags, you could do something like inner dot or excuse me dot inner HTML and that returns the actual HTML. If you want to affect attributes or interact with them, you can use the dot get attribute or the dot set attribute. Now let's show some actual examples of all of this. Here I'm going to be actually manipulating this page that I'm looking at right now. So again, to edit styles, we've already seen we can use the dot style tag. Now we're going to show you how to edit actual HTML or text or attributes. So I'm going to grab this paragraph right here that I'm highlighting. Let's show you how we can do that. I'll create a new variable. Let's call it P for paragraph, although you can probably call it whatever you want. We'll say document dot query selector and I'm going to grab the paragraph tag here. And if I type paragraph, I can see I have the paragraph tag and I can expand this to actually view everything that says to edit styles. I see there's a link here to attributes. So if I click on this attributes link, it takes me to google.com. So here I see Google opening up. Now what I actually want to do is change some of the text here. So I will clear this and I'm going to say p dot text content and now I can set it equal to anything that I want. So let's call it all new text and then hit enter. And now I see that I've actually changed the text here. So it says new text. Now imagine that I wanted to make the text bold. Well, what I can't do is this. I'm not able to say text content and then pass in a strong tag and say something like, I'm bold, closing strong tag. The reason I'm not able to do something like this, and we'll see why what happens, is because I'm just grabbing the text content. If I actually want to affect the HTML, I need to grab the inner HTML. So I will say p dot inner HTML, and I'm going to set it equal now to what I previously did. So let's grab this and just copy and paste it. In fact, I'll grab it with the quotes and then hit enter. And I can see now my paragraph is in bold, it says I'm bold. And I can see that it's darker. So that's the difference between text content and inner HTML. If you want to actually pass in HTML tags when you're interacting with the HTML, then you're going to need to call inner HTML instead of just text content. Now let's show you how you can get attributes and set attributes. So if we look down here, there's a link to Facebook all the way here at the end. So if I click on this, it takes me to Facebook and says I'm another header with a special ID. So don't worry about that for right now. Instead what I'm going to do is clear my console and I'm going to grab everything with the special ID. So I'll say var special is equal to document query selector and remember it's an ID so I say hashtag since I can use CSS style selectors and then say special. And again, you would, whoops, there we go. And again, you would have to know that there's a special ID in the HTML. Here it's actually telling me that, but you'd have to actually reference the HTML to know this. It's not like special is just some sort of normal ID. So here I can see now if I type in special, I have heading four ID is equal to special. It says I'm another header. Looks like the header has emphasis. And then I also see h ref to facebook.com. Now, how can I actually change this? Well, I can say this, I can say variable special a is equal to, and then I'm going to grab special dot, and I will do a query selector on that. I will say query selector, grab the anchor tag, hit enter. And now when I see special A, I see that I've only grabbed the anchor tag. So I can see that I can actually call multiple query selectors until I actually find or get what I'm looking for. So here's the href, it goes to facebook.com. If I actually want to get just the attribute, I can say special A dot get attribute. And then I can grab the href itself if I only want to grab that link. If I want to change the attribute, then I need to use the set attribute. So I need to say special a dot set attribute. 
and this takes in two arguments. The attribute that you want to change and then the actual value you want to change it to. So we'll say HTTPS and let's change it to something like Amazon.com. We hit enter and now we've actually changed this to Amazon.com. So if I click on this link, instead of Facebook, we see that it takes me to Amazon. All right, so that's the general way of using these four methods. Remember, text content is just for returning the text. Inner HTML returns the actual HTML. And if you want to affect attributes within something, you need to do it with set attribute. If you want to just grab the attribute, you can get, say, get attribute. If you want to change it, instead of doing just an equal sign like we did earlier, you use set attribute, where the first argument is the actual attribute, and the second argument is what you want to set it to. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums, and I'm happy to help you out. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to part three, document object model events. And we're going to learn how to use JavaScript to trigger on events. So we don't always want to have to specify beforehand how to interact with the document object model. It's unrealistic that we're going to be editing the console every single time, or that we'll magically know in the JavaScript what we want to actually interact with. Many times we only want the interaction to occur on a particular event, such as a click or a hover. And that's what you've been used to when you visit real websites. What we want to do is achieve this sort of effect by adding what's known as an event listener. And the JavaScript will be listening for an event to occur and then execute a function when it happens. Let me show you some example code so you can get a better idea of what I mean by this. Imagine we want to listen for an event. Well, the basic form looks like this. It's my variable, whatever variable you happen to have grabbed from the document object model. Then you say dot add event listener, you call that method, and then you pass in a particular event and a function. So for example, let's say we grab the head of the document or heading one by saying document.querySelector h1. Then off of that variable, we would say add event listener, pass in an event name and an example event name is such as click, and then comma, we would pass in some function, such as the change color function that we've seen earlier. And that's the basic form of event listeners. You pass in a particular event name, and then you pass in a function that you've created or a built-in function that you want to have happen upon the event. So there are many, many possible events. Uh, just a few of them are things such as clicks, hovers, double clicks, dragging, and there's much more. What I recommend is if you're really interested in all these events, then check out this link right here. You can just uh, Google search Mo developer Mozilla JavaScript events, or excuse me, document object model events, and it'll probably take you to this page, but there's the link if you want it. We're just going to show you a few of the most useful events. So let's explore these events. I'm going to hop over to my editor and browser and show you how you can make the interaction functions occur upon a particular event. Okay, so I have my editor open, and I also have a blank HTML file called main.html, and then I also have a blank JavaScript file called myscript.js. And I'm going to grab the full path to main HTML, and then go to it in my browser on the right-hand side. And it's blank right now. So let's put in some HTML content. That way we can, in the future, grab it using document object model. So right now in the body, I'm going to add in three h1 tags. The first h1 tag is going to say hover over me. And we're going to give it an ID equal to one. Then the second h1 tag, it's going to say click me and we'll give it an ID tag of two. And then heading one, it gets an ID tag, you've probably guessed it, of three. And it's going to say, double click me. We're going to save that. Let's refresh our page. And here we see hover over me, click me, and double click me. And now let's connect it using the script tag. So I will say script and then src, the source is equal to myscript.js. Save that. And now let's hop over to myscript.js and show you how we can add in event listeners. So the first thing we need to do is actually grab the document object model variables that we want. So the first one we'll call head1, and I want that to be document. 
query selector. And then I can just pass in hashtag one. And I'm going to copy and paste this line since the next two are gonna look really similar. So instead of one, we'll say the ID two. And then instead of one there, we'll say three. And then coming all the way over here, we'll change this as well to head three and then head two. So we have everything. And just to make sure it's all connected, I'm going to say console.log connected. Let's save this, refresh our page, and here I see console.log connected. So everything's working well. I can get rid of this now. And let's show you how to add a basic event listener. First thing we need to do after grabbing from the document object model is grab the variable, and then you say dot, and you add an event listener, and make sure your spelling and capitalization is correct here. So add event listener. And one event you may want to do is what's known as a mouse over. And that's essentially whenever your mouse is hovering over some object or some HTML attribute, then the function will take place. So the keyword here is mouse over. That's the event name. And then we pass a function curly brackets, and then hit enter. And here is where we can define the function. What we do we want to actually happen when we call mouse over. So let's have the text change. So I will say head one dot text content is equal to mouse currently over. Let's save that. We'll refresh our page. And now you'll notice when I hover my mouse over this one time, it says mouse currently over and then it stops. So that's the very basic of mouse over. Let's add one more change to this. We'll also change the color. We'll say head one style.color and set that equal to something really obvious like red. Save it refresh the page, and then I see hover over me, and as I come in and I hover over, it says mouse currently over, and then I can't change it back. So how do we actually make it so that once my mouse comes off of it, it reverts back? Well, the way we can do that is with the mouse out event. So again, I grab head one, I add an events listener, and then I say mouse out, pass any function call here, and for this function call, we will have it say head one, and we will call the text content of head one to be equal to what it originally said. And what it originally said was something like hover over me. And then let's change it back to its original color. And its original color was black. Okay. So here we can save this and let's try this again. And now we should see the change. If I'm saying mouse currently over, I pull my mouse off and it says hover over me. And now I can see it turn on and off as my mouse hovers over it. So pretty cool. You can kind of play around with this a lot, but that's the very basics of adding an event listener. Again, you're grabbing something from the document object model, probably using query selector. In the next section, we'll learn how to do this with jQuery. And then you say add event listener, whatever event you're looking for. You can check out that link for a huge list of event names. And then you pass in the function and what you actually want to occur in that function when this event takes place. All right, so that's a very basic event listener. Let's show you some more basic ones such as on clicks. I'll grab head two, add an event listener. And for a click, it's just that keyword, click. Then I will call function and the function I want here is, let's change it upon click. So we'll say head to text content. We'll have it say clicked on. And we'll also change its color just so it's really obvious. Head to style.color. And I'm going to change that to be blue. Let's save it.
refresh over here. And right now as I hover over this thing, it changes. If I click on the click me, I can see it says clicked on. All right, pretty cool so far. Finally, let's show you how we can do a double click. Head to add event listener. The keyword for this one is DBL click. That stands for double click. Again, we have the function call, curly brackets, and then whatever you want happens to any really HTML element on the page. We'll do it to, whoops, this should actually be head three, not head two, my apologies. And then let's change the text content and we'll say, I was double clicked. And then we'll say head three. Let's also change the color and we'll set it equal to red. Save it, refresh our page, and we can see here my hover is working. I'm gonna click this, it's got clicked on, and then if I double, if I only click once, you can't really see it or hear it, but I'm only clicking once here. It's only until I double click that I see I was double clicked. All right, so that's the basics of using events with JavaScript and the document object model. Coming up next, we're going to be doing a walkthrough of a very simple game project, a very, very simple tic-tac-toe model. It's not even going to be a full game of tic-tac-toe, just to get an idea of what all of this would look like in a larger front-end stack project. Thanks, everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part four, the game project of the document object model section of the course. It's time to actually get some practice with the document object model and using JavaScript to interact with it. We're going to be creating a very simple tic-tac-toe game interface. And you have two options on the approach for this project. Your first option is to try to replicate the game completely on your own. So at the end of this lecture, we'll show you what the game looks like and you can try to replicate the game on your own in the editor and try your best. The second option is to just follow along with the solution lecture that comes after this one for a code along session. I personally recommend you try at least once completely on your own to get some practice of seeing something and then trying to replicate it on your own. That's a really great skill to have. But if you're still not that comfortable with the material, that's no problem. Feel free to just move on to the solution lecture and have a code along session until you feel more comfortable manipulating the document object model. Let's start by seeing what the final game actually looks like. Okay, here I have the game open, and this is essentially what it looks like. You can see I'm using some bootstrap here for the Jumbotron, and I have a little button that says restart. And all this is, it's a table, and it's a three by three table, but you notice when I actually click on this, I see an X, and if I click on another square, I get an O if I click twice, so it goes X, O, blank. And this is a very, very simple project, so you'll notice if I get three in a row, there's no announcement of any sort of win. All I want to focus on here is just manipulating the do document object model. So it's a very, very simple project as far as any logic. The only logic that's being done here is that when I click on something, it'll end up cycling through the X, the O, and the blank. And this is just a table with some CSS styling to make it look like a tic-tac-toe board. And then if I click restart here, it just refreshes and clears everything out. That's all you have to do for the tic-tac-toe project. Again, I recommend that you at least try this completely on your own to replicate something that looks like this. Or if you still don't feel that comfortable, just head on over to the next lecture where I'm going to be coding through the solution. All right, thanks everyone. Best of luck, I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be coding out the solutions for the game project, that tic-tac-toe project from the previous lecture. Hopefully you had a chance to attempt it on your own, but if not, feel free to code along with me right now. I'm going to hop over to my editor and browser to get started. Okay, here I am at my editor and here's the browser. And I have three files open, an empty HTML file, an empty CSS file, and an empty JavaScript file. So we're ready to really tackle the front end and see its capabilities with this little project of ours. Let's start off by creating the HTML file and filling out the actual content. Then we'll style it and then we'll actually add the interactivity with JavaScript. I'm going to type HTML there. Just to set it up, we have tic-tac-toe and let's actually link our CSS file. So I'm going to link right now to my CSS file, which I've just called game.css. 
And then I'm also going to link to Bootstrap. That way I can use the Jumbotron later. All you have to do to do that is come to getbootstrap.com. And then I can just scroll down here and grab the latest compiled and minified CSS. Copy and paste that line into my file. And let's check that we're ready to go by just putting a heading in here saying connected. Let's make sure that font looks good. Refresh our page. And here we have connected in Bootstrap font, so we know we're good to go. Okay, so far my links are okay. And I also want to link to my script. Let's just do that over here at the bottom. So all the way at the bottom, I'm gonna call script. And we're going to make the source equal to my script, which is called myscript.js. We'll save that. And to verify that's connected, I'm going to do a console log that says connected. Save that. We'll refresh this page and then let's inspect view the console. Let me expand this just so we can see it. And it says connected, so we're good to go there. Fantastic. Now we need to create some HTML content to actually create the board. Let's comment this out. And then coming back to main, let's expand this. First thing you wanted to do is, since we're dealing with Bootstrap, create a div tag that contains the class container. So this will have the container class. And then inside of this, I'm going to create the Jumbotron. Then we'll have a heading inside this Jumbotron that says, welcome to tic-tac-toe, tic-tac-toe. And we can put a paragraph in here if we want. It says, get ready to play. Let's save this and refresh, make sure it actually looks good. Okay, welcome tic-tac-toe, get ready to play. And then finally, let's add a button. Remember we had that restart button. So I will call a button tag, and then it will have the type button. The name button's fine, but let's give it a class. And the class we are going to just reference bootstrap for this. So I wouldn't expect you to have this memorized. I would expect you to reference the documentation. But the class I chose was btn. And then I also added the btn primary to it. And then I wanted to make the button large. So I added btn lg. So basically what's happening here is this class tells it it's a bootstrap button. This tells it it's a primary bootstrap button. So that takes care of the coloring. And this takes care of the sizing btn large. Let me save this. And let's also add what we want the button to say. So let's have it say something like restart. And we could put this on multiple lines if we wanted to. I'll just keep it on one line. I'm pretty zoomed in right now, but let's refresh. And here we have restart. I can click on it, nothing's happening, but it's all working the way we want it to so far. Now let's continue on. Something to think about at this stage is I will probably want to reference this button later on in my JavaScript. Since it's the only button on the page, let's just give it an ID. We could also call it by its tag, but I like calling things by their ID. So let's give it the ID B, so I can call it later. And what we're going to do is add in the table that's going to represent our board. We're going to add in the table, and then we'll have to style it to actually make it look like a board. So let's continue on with that. I'm going to put this inside of the container, but outside of the Jumbotron. So let's expand that. So here we are now inside the container, but outside the Jumbotron. I'm going to call a table. And I'm going to say my table has a line equal to center. And then inside of this, I have three table rows. So we'll say TR. And inside of each row, there's going to be three cells. So TD, and we'll leave them blank for now. TD, leave that one blank, and then TD, leave that one blank. And now let's do this two more times. You can just copy and paste. And if we save this, we should have our table right here. But you'll notice there's actually nothing showing up, and that's because we have no styling attached to this table. So let's come over to the .css script and actually give some styling so we make sure that we're actually seeing this table. I'm going to give styling to the actual table cells, the TD, and let's give it a height of 150 pixels. And these values are pretty arbitrary, so you could have put whatever you wanted. 
also give it a width of 150 pixels, so they're squares. I'm going to text align center, and the reason for that is when I put an X or an O inside of the actual cell, I want it to be center aligned. And then let's give it a border. This will allow us to see it. We'll say five pixel solid black border. And then let's give it a font size of 100 pixels. And again, this font size refers to when I'm actually going to be inputting X's and O's. So let's save this. We'll refresh over here. And now I see my tic-tac-toe board. Great. And let's practice manually putting in an X over here. So let's put an X into the very first table cell, save this, refresh, and there's my X. And it's text aligned centered, which is exactly what we wanted. Great. Hopefully you were able to get this far with uh, very few difficulties. I know it may look kind of daunting when you see just what the browser, um, but on the HTML and CSS side, it's definitely everything that we've done before, and it's pretty straightforward. Now what might not be so straightforward, especially since we were just learning it, is the actual JavaScript code to manipulate the document object model to play the game. So let's get started on that. I'm going to have a few sections. I'll have the restart game button. Then I'll have some sort of section that grabs all the squares. Then I also want some sort of function that can clear all the squares. And then I want to create a function that will check the square marker. So something like check the square marker. So check if it's an X or no. And then finally, I want some sort of for loop to add event listeners to all the squares. OK. So those are the main tasks we have to do in our JavaScript code. And I'm going to approach this in the next lecture. That way, you can spend some time to review the HTML and CSS. In the next lecture, we'll actually code out all this JavaScript. Thanks, everyone, and I'll see you there. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here right where we left off last time with the JavaScript file open. Again, we defined the sections of code that we actually have to code out. So let's get started with just the restart game button. First off, let's make the variable. Let's grab it from the document object model. I'm going to say, call it restart. And it's going to be equal to the document. And then I will use query selector on the document. And I'm going to grab the tag that I made for it. Or excuse me, not the tag, the ID. I could have also done a button tag since it's the only button on here. But let's just do hashtag B, because if I look at my main file here, I gave it the ID B, so that looks good. Then I want to grab all the squares. So I'll create a variable called squares, and then I'll set that equal to document query selector, whoops, query selector, and let's have it be query selector all because I want all the squares, and that's going to be the same as all the table cells. And something to note here is that I spelled squares wrong. So there we go. OK, so there's are all the squares. And then I want to create a function that clears all the squares. So how do we do that? Well, I'll say function. And let's give this function the name clear board. And for this, I'll have a for loop that goes for every cell or everything in the squares. And then it just makes the content blank. So let me show you what I mean by that. We'll say four, and the array we're going to be playing with is the squares array. And then I can click to deactivate that. So from i equals zero all the way to i less than squares dot length increasing, I'm going to grab the current cell and then change its text content to be blank. And that's all I'm doing to clear the board. So what is this actually doing? Well, remember, query selector all is going to return all the table cells. And that I have saved as squares. And then we're going to have a function called clear board that basically loops through everything in square, so every element in what is basically acting like an array. It's not quite a JavaScript array, but it's acting like one. And then we can just say squares i dot text content and then set that equal to blank. 
Let's test to see that this clear board function works by adding an event listener to restart. Remember restart is just our actual restart button. So I will say restart, add event listener. And upon a click, it's going to call the function clear board. So let's save this. And right now I have an X in there, so I will refresh the page. It's blank right now, so if I click restart, I'm not gonna see any difference. So I will come back to my main HTML and add something to one of these cells. Let's give it an X, refresh my page. I see that X now. If I click restart, it was cleared. So it looks like everything's working. So I'm going to come back here and then clear this so we can refresh this page. So far we have a function that successfully loops through every cell in the table and clears it, makes its text content nothing. All right, now we've reached what's probably the most challenging part of this project, which is getting the board to display X's and O's or blanks, depending on if we click on a cell. So how can we actually do this? Well, the way you could probably do it, given what you know so far, is to come back to this HTML file, give each cell a specific ID, and then come back to JavaScript and add event listeners for each particular ID, checking to see if it's in blank, X, or O, and then changing the marker depending on it, where it's been clicked. So that's one way of doing it. The official solutions have a way that uses the JavaScript this keyword that is used in a way we haven't seen before. So I'm going to show you first the solution that you have the capability to come up with on your own. However, it's repetitive. Then after that, I'll show you the solution that's more advanced and uses a this keyword, but is a little cleaner and uses a for loop. So let's start off with the most basic solution we can think of, and we'll just run it for one cell. I'm going to give this cell an ID of one, and then coming back to my JavaScript, I'm going to make some new lines for myself, and we're going to make a variable called cell one, and have it be equal to the document, query selector, and then we'll give it the ID of one. And now we're going to say cell one, we'll add an event listener to it. So there's our event listener, and upon click, we'll have it do something. So we'll say function, and we'll grab cell one, and we'll say its text content is going to be equal to X. So this is the most basic way we could do this. Let me refresh the page and make sure this is actually working. So now a cell one, I click on it, it becomes X, if I hit restart, then it gets blank. So right now if I click on it, uh, it only turns X once. So let's add the functionality where it cycles through blank, X, and O. So we can add some logic here in order to make that happen. I'm going to say if cell one dot text content is equal to blank, remember that's how it starts off as, then cell one dot text content, set that equal to X. Else if cell one dot text content is equal to X, then I'm going to say cell one text content becomes equal to O. And then else, what we're going to be doing here is setting it back equal to blank. So we'll say cell one text content is equal to blank. So this should effectively cycle through X's and O's. And let's make sure we actually got the logic right here. If I see that the text content is blank, I'm going to set the text content to X. If when I click on it, I see that the current text content is X, well then it'll set it, be set to zero or O. And then if it's neither blank nor X, then it must be O, so I will cycle it back to being blank. Okay, let's save this and refresh, see if it works. So here I click on this, right now it's X, click on it again, 
it becomes O, click on it one more time, and it's blank. Great. So this is what you have the capability and knowledge of doing right now. Technically, you then could have just copied and pasted this eight more times and changed cell one to cell two, cell three, cell four, etc. And that's how you could have solved this problem. Okay, so this is the solution you would have probably come up with and you would have just copied and pasted this maybe eight more times. And that's one way of doing it without using the this keyword. And that's one of the most basic ways of doing it. However, it really violates the dry principle of coding, which is don't repeat yourself. So what we're going to be doing is showing you how you can use the this keyword to do something really similar, except not have it be repeated so often. So I'm going to create a function and I will call this function change marker. And it's essentially going to be a very generic version of what we just wrote. I'm going to say if, and then I'm going to use the this keyword text content is equal to x, oh, excuse me, is equal to blank. Then what I'll end up doing is saying this text content, and this should have been triple equal sign, and then we'll reset this to be x. Then we'll have an else if, and this is going to say if this text content is equal to x, then I'm going to set this text content equal to O. And then else, if that's the case, then I'm going to say this text content and set it back equal to being blank. All right, so that's the most generic version of this and it's using the this keyword. And this is inside of a function, which we haven't really seen before. We've only seen that this keyword inside a method, inside an object, but a function is pretty similar to a method. So hopefully this is making sense to you so far, especially since we just ran the more specific version of this. This is basically the generic version. So what we need to do is add this as an event listener for all the squares. So I will say four, and then I will again loop through squares and then I'm going to say dot add an event listener. And upon click, I'm going to call change marker. And now let's refresh our page and see if this works. So it's working on the first one. And now I can see it's working on any of them. So this is the tic-tac-toe project. And that's really all you had to do. And now when I click restart, it gets cleared. That's the most generic version of solving that issue of X's and O's. Would I have expected you to solve this on your own with this solution? Uh, maybe, probably not. It's a little more advanced and it's a little beyond the scope of what we covered in the sections of the course about JavaScript. But don't worry, in the next section, we're going to be covering jQuery, which is going to give you the skills to naturally come up with a much smoother and better way of accessing document object model material or properties. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the project. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the jQuery section of the course. Let's briefly break down what jQuery is and why you would want to use it. Keep in mind, this course is not meant to be a full course on JavaScript in any way. There's a lot more JavaScript can do than what we've covered in this course, and there are many other libraries for it, such as Angular, React, Node.js. Really, this course is not gonna cover any of those topics because they're outside the scope of this course, and we won't really need them to build a full web application. What we do is we learn JavaScript and jQuery in order to use them with Django later on. So what is jQuery? Well, jQuery is essentially just a JavaScript library, and it's a large single .js file that has many pre-built methods and objects that really simplify your workflow, specifically when you're interacting with the document object model and making HTTP requests through the use of AJAX, which we're going to talk about when we talk about Django later on. Previously, we've learned how to interact with the DOM using what's known as vanilla JavaScript, which is another way of saying just plain JavaScript. And we were able to use methods such as document.getElementById, and later on we learned about methods such as document.querySelector. When jQuery was first created, the more robust and convenient methods such as .querySelector and .querySelectorAll actually didn't exist in vanilla JavaScript. So jQuery was created as a way to help simplify interactions with the DOM. And one of its main features is the use of the dollar sign. 
So how do we actually get jQuery? Well, we have two options. One is to link a CDN hosted file, like we did for when we were using Bootstrap. And then the other one is to actually download the .js file from jQuery's official website and just link to it locally using a script tag. So again, once you connect to the jQuery using the script tag in your HTML, then you can call the specialized jQuery calls that allow you to interact with the DOM. And let me show you a few examples of how jQuery differs from vanilla JavaScript. So on top we have what a jQuery call looks like, and on the bottom we have what a vanilla JavaScript looks like. Here you can see that we basically replace the document.query selector all call in normal JavaScript with a single dollar sign. And here, both of these jQuery and vanilla JavaScript calls are grabbing all the elements that are under a div tag. And hopefully just from this clear example, you can see that you're going to save a lot of typing and a lot of work with the simple dollar sign command that jQuery has. Let's imagine another situation where you actually want to edit the styling of a certain variable. So here with jQuery, we have some variable called el. And here we've grabbed el and we said .css, border width, and then set it to 20 pixels. In vanilla JavaScript, you would have to call el.style.border width is equal to 20 pixels. So hopefully you can see now that jQuery basically allows you to just input any property of CSS, any style property, directly using the .css method, and then as a second argument, what you want the change result to be. And that's a better workflow as far as uh, being more robust. And then finally, let's show you something that would be a function call with jQuery versus vanilla. So on the bottom here, you have vanilla, where you're saying, is the document in a ready state loading? If not, add an event listener, DOM content loading. Here, jQuery can do this all in one simple line of code. OK, as you can see, some situations are helped tremendously by jQuery, while others may not really necessitate it. Due to its massive popularity, it's still very important to understand it because you're going to be running into it a lot in the real world. And if you didn't know jQuery, you would end up reading someone else's code and just be flabbergasted why these dollar sign calls were everywhere. OK, so let's start learning how to interact with the DOM with jQuery. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to part one, basic jQuery. In this lecture, we're going to start off learning how to interact with the DOM with jQuery. And the relevant file for this lecture is part one underscore mydocument.html. We're going to be using the console for our commands, but we're also going to show you how you can link your own HTML file to jQuery. Let's hop over to the browser to get started. Okay, here I have my editor open with the file I just referenced, part one, my document. And then I also have it linked here in my browser as well as code.jquery.com. First, I wanna briefly walk through this HTML file. You'll notice here I have a style call and that's basically just in lieu of a CSS sheet, but I have a turn blue class, which is a color white background blue, and then a turn red class, which has the text color be white, but the background be red. So keep that in mind as we continue through this lecture. But you'll also notice that not only do I have a link to Bootstrap, but I also have a script call here that connects me to jQuery. And let me show you how you can actually grab that yourself. All you have to do is go to code.jquery.com, that's C-O-D-E dot J-Q-U-E-R-Y dot C-O-M, and this will take you to this website showing you the latest stable versions of the CDN for jQuery. And then you can just come here and we're going to be using jQuery 3. And you'll have a couple options, uncompressed, minified, slim, and slim minified. Basically, these are just variations on how large the file size is. If you get uncompressed, that's the largest possible. If you do slim minified, that's probably the smallest possible. And what you can do is just click on any of these. So we can do fully uncompressed and you can just copy this and then paste it into your file and that will give you the source for the actual .js. And if you're interested in this, you can actually just copy this link right here and then put it into your browser. And this will actually be the entire .js file. So this is what jQuery is. It's just this really large file. Um, and this is the uncompressed version. If you come back here and check out the slim minified version, we click on that link and then grab that HTTP and put that in your browser. You'll notice that this is uh, much slimmer and way more condensed. So it makes for a smaller file because it doesn't have as much white space. Although good luck reading this because it's 
frankly way too compressed for any normal person to read it. All right, moving along, let's get started with selecting of jQuery. What I'm going to do now is just expand this and then open up my console here. So I will inspect, open up my console, and now I'm ready to go. So to confirm that you have jQuery loaded, what you should do is just type in a single dollar sign, hit enter, and if you see some function come out, then you know that jQuery has been loaded, and you can test this again by saying dollar sign, and then passing in a tag that you wanna grab. So if you're using jQuery, and you wanna grab everything with a tag, you can just type in dollar sign, and then in parentheses, whatever tag you're interested in. So for example, for heading one, if I get that, then I get back everything that has heading one as a object there. And for example, if I wanna grab all the list items, I say li, and then I get back what is sort of like an array. It's not quite an array, but it basically acts like one as far as indexing purposes of the list items. And then you'll notice that I have a special list. So one of these has an ID of special. Okay, let's save this to a variable. I'll say var. And we'll call my variable x, say dollar sign, heading one, hit enter. And then with this, with jQuery activated, if I want to edit any of the CSS properties, it's really easy. I just say x.css, and then it takes in two parameters, the first one being the CSS property. So let's say the color, and then the second one being whatever you want to change it to. So let's change heading one to be red. And there you see immediately on top there, selecting of jQuery has been turned red now. And if I want to change the background, I can say anything like CSS, background, and then pass in another color. Let's, for instance, make it really obvious with blue. So hopefully you can see now that working with jQuery just makes your life a whole lot easier, and especially when we're using Django later on in the course. Now you can edit multiple CSS properties at once instead of just passing in uh, one argument and one parameter what you end up doing is just passing in an object. Let me show you what that looks like. So I can say a variable, new CSS, and this will be an object. So I'm going to be creating a JavaScript object right now, which remember basically acts like a dictionary. So here I'll change the color to be white. I will change the background to be blue which is essentially going to be keeping it blue. And then I'm going to create the border to be red. And then let's finish off our object. So if I see new CSS, I see I have this JavaScript object. And now what I can do is say x.css, pass in my JavaScript object, and then that's going to change all of them at once. So you can see it has now a border red, although you can't really see the border. So let's edit that a little more. Let's make the border something like 20 pixel, whoops, pixels solid red. And let's change the background to be something like green. Hit enter. And now let's run x.css, new CSS again. And here we can see the green, the red, and the white. All right, let's revisit the topic of grabbing multiple objects at once. So we already saw that with the list items, but let me clear the page and show that again. If I create a variable and call it list items and set it equal to everything that has a list tag, I get back, if I check it out, what essentially looks like an array. Now, technically this is not a JavaScript array. It acts more like what's known as a list in JavaScript or a node list, but Instead, what we're going to be showing you is how you can index particular items off of this. So if I call list items and say .css and change the style. So for instance, I say color is blue. Then it changes everything with a list tag, if we look at this, to the color blue. If I only want to grab one of them, what I can do is use the .eq method to grab a particular index item. And the way that works is you say list items dot eq and then pass in the number of the index you want. So for the very first one, it's going to be zero. And then off of this, you can call CSS and change whatever properties you want. 
So now let's change that color to something more obvious like orange. And if we come back here, expand this, I can see now the very first item in that list has been changed to orange and everything else is, has retained the color blue. Now you can also grab the last item by saying list items dot eq and then using negative indexing. So negative one will then return the last item. So let's make that color something like, well, let's just make it orange as well. We'll hit enter. And if we scroll down here, we see now that last item is orange. Okay, now let's talk about grabbing text and HTML. Remember previously we had to use things like inner HTML or text content. jQuery makes that much easier. So I'm going to say dollar sign h1 and I don't even really have to save it as a variable. I can just call the method or property right here and it's going to be text. So this says selecting of jQuery. Remember that's the text I have up here. And if I want to change that, all I have to do is pass in whatever new text I want. So I will say brand new text. And that changes the text. So again, it's just the variable, or in this case, I haven't even saved it to a variable. It's just the dollar sign call and then dot text, whatever text you want. If you want to actually change the HTML, all you have to do is say, again, either your variable or your tag call. And then we can say HTML, close parentheses, that returns the actual HTML. In this case, there's nothing special about it. But if I want to edit the HTML, let's make it emphasized. I'm going to say EM, new, and then close EM. And just like before, you can't do this with just a text call, otherwise it won't actually take the tags into effect. And here I can see up on the top, that it is in italics now or emphasize text. Okay, finally, let's talk about two more things, attributes and values and then classes. So attributes and values are also very easy to deal with when you're working with jQuery. For instance, if we scroll to the bottom of this page, we see we have an input button. So we have this form with some stuff and initially it says enter your name or something and then we can click on submit what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab anything that has input. So we can see there's two of these. There's the first one and then the second one. So both of these, this text box and this submit button. And what I'm going to be doing here is say input dot EQ one. And then if I want to actually affect the attribute of one of these inputs, and remember the attribute can be something like what type of input it is. Remember when we're creating an input in HTML, I have to specify what type it is, whether it's a button, a radio button, a checkbox, submit, text area, etc. So all I have to say is ATTR. And then just like with CSS, the first argument is whatever the attribute you're looking for. So I will affect the type. And then the second one is what you actually want to change that attribute to. In this case, let's change the type to checkbox. And now that I've hit enter, I can see that the submit button went away and it's now a checkbox on my screen. All right, let's show another way to affect a value. So if I want to affect the value of this input text box here, what I can do is grab anything with input. And then what I'm going to say is dot EQ grab the first item there, because I want to affect that text box, and then say dot .val, which is going to be the value, and it's just a single parameter here, because we're specifically saying I want to affect the value of that text box, so I will say new value, I hit enter, and I see the text box value has been changed to new value. And that's special with the dot .val call. All right, now finally, whoops, I want to discuss classes. So remember we have CSS classes, and if we go back to our HTML document here, I see I have two classes, turn blue and turn red. So that's something to keep in mind. Let me refresh this page so we can get everything back to normal. Okay, and let me show you how you can add a class with jQuery. All you have to do is have a dollar sign here, select something, so let's select the header. In this case, it's H1, or actually, yeah, H1. And then if we want to add a class, all you have to do is call add class and then the name of the class. So let's say turn red. 
and there we can see it turned red. If I want to remove a class, it's very similar process, call h1, and then call dot remove class, and then we can remove turn red. Now usually what you end up wanting to do is toggle class, not just add a class, because if we already have the red class on it, we want to remove the red class. If it doesn't have the red class already, then we want to add it. So the way you can do that is by using toggle. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to call h1 again, and let's show it with blue class. So I will say toggle class turn blue. And you can see it turned blue. But if I run the exact same line of code again, toggle class, it will turn it back off. So you can see that it's toggling it on and off. So now you don't have to worry about add class and remove class. You can just use toggle class instead. It really depends on your situation, whether or not you want to use toggle class or just a simple add or remove call, but know that you have the option there. All right, that's really all I wanted to talk about for jQuery for this particular lecture. Hopefully you saw how easy it is to work with jQuery. And if you want a reference for all the commands we just showed, you can just go to part one basic jQuery.js under the jQuery folder, and it has all the commands in a JavaScript file that we went through here in the console. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part two jQuery events. In this lecture, we're going to be using the same HTML file from the previous lecture, but we're also going to be connecting it to a JS file where we will be using jQuery to work with events. Let's get started by hopping over to the editor and the browser. Okay, so I have the HTML file from the previous lecture open here on the editor, as well as linked to in the browser. Now we're going to be linking this to our own JavaScript. So if we go all the way down here I've added a script tag with the source myscript.js. Just change that to whatever .js you have in the same directory as this HTML file. Here's the empty.js, and let's show you some basic event handling with jQuery. First, let's talk about clicks. Imagine we want to have the heading one here change when you click on it. What you can do is say something like h1, and then you have the event call. So that can be something like click. And I'm going to show you a link later on. I actually have it here open in my browser with all the different type of event methods that you can call using jQuery. There are a ton of them available to you. We're going to be going over the most basic ones and the most useful ones. So dot click is definitely one of those. And inside of this is where you pass in your function that you want to have executed when something gets clicked, specifically heading one element here. So we're going to, let's just say we log something first. So there was a click. We will save that. And let's refresh this page and open up our console so we can actually see the log. Let me expand this a little bit. Here's the console. And I'm going to click on H1. And I see there was a click. Perfect. So it's all working out. Now let's expand on this idea by actually grabbing multiple elements. So there's only one heading one, but what if I pass in li? Well, this is actually going to basically work automatically, thanks to jQuery, where if I say console.log any li was clicked, save this, I refresh this page, and now if I click on any li item, you can see here that it keeps getting repeated. Perfect. Now, if you actually want to call methods or properties off, whatever specific variable you're interacting with here, you have to use the this keyword. And let me show you an example of what that would look like. Imagine that I want to change the heading every time I click on it. Well, what you can end up doing is you call dollar sign, and in parentheses, you pass in the this keyword. And inside of an event call like this, the this keyword is referring to whatever object you are currently performing that event on. So we have this, and then off of that, you can call it just like the variables we saw in the previous lecture. So if I want to change the text, I just grab text and then say I was changed. So we will save that and let's close this for now and refresh the page. I'm going to click on heading one here and we can see I was changed. So again, with jQuery, 
you kind of have this funky keyword with this, but also in combination with the dollar sign. So if we have an event call inside of the function, if we want to actually affect what's going on here, we have to have dollar sign, this, and then dot, and any of the previous methods we saw from the previous lecture. Okay, so that's the basics of clicks, and there's also things like double clicks, hover over, mouse over, there's a lot of stuff like that. And if you want the complete reference, they're all here in category events. For instance, let's say we're looking for double click. Well, I can expand this, zoom in. Let's say I'm looking for something that has to do with click or double click. Well, I can start typing click. I see the event handler for click, but I can keep searching. And here I see double click right below it with dbl click. So that's what I would have to call instead of click if I only wanted the event to listen for a double click. All right. Now for events, we are not just limited to things like clicks or mouse overs with just our mouse. We can actually perform actions on our keyboard and that's known as a key press. Let's walk through a few examples of interacting the key press using jQuery. So I will use the dollar sign notation and grab the input tags. If we scroll down here, we see we have two input tags, the text box right here and then submit so I just want to grab the text one. So I will say EQ zero, since it's the very first input that shows up on the page. And then I'm going to call the method key press on this. And I will call a function to occur whenever I press a key inside of that text box. And what I'm going to have happen is I will change heading three. I'm going to toggle its class to turn blue. And let's save that. I'll refresh my browser over here. And now we'll see what happens as I begin to type in this box. We can see that the toggle class is toggling this turn blue on and off. So again, what's happening here? Well, I'm grabbing all the input tags, then indexing to grab the very first one, which is the text box, and then assigning a key press method to it, where every time I press a key inside that text box, this function occurs and this function grabs the heading three tags, toggles their class to be turn blue. Okay, now we can actually grab an event object from this that has a ton of information. And let me show you how we can do that. Inside of this function, I can input the special keyword event. And I'm going to log this. So I will say console.log this event. And you can see that it's highlighted to indicate that it's a keyword. Now I'm going to refresh this page. And as I type, you'll notice I get a console log. And this is known as an event object. And this event object has a ton of information on it, which we're really not gonna need to know. But if you scroll all the way down, there's a which property here. And if we click on that, we see that which is equal to 97. And that corresponded with the letter A. If I type B, then I get a new object. I'll open it up, click on which, and we see we have 98. If I type the letter C, open up the new event object, scroll all the way down, I see I have 99. So there are actual number codes for every key on your keyboard, which makes sense because maybe I only want an action to occur when I hit enter or press W or press an up and down arrow key, which means we can actually specify event.which to grab a particular code. So let's see that in action. I'm going to say if event.which is equal to, and I'm going to use the key code 13, which is the enter key. I will change heading three to be toggle class turn blue. And let's save this. I'm going to refresh the page. And now we should see that as I type stuff, nothing really happens. It's not until I press enter, which I know you can't see, that the change occurs. So right now I'm just pressing enter on my keyboard and the change is occurring. For any other key press, nothing will happen. And that's how you can use the event object to grab information. And with key presses, dot which will tell you a numerical code that corresponds to the key. And you can just Google online for the numerical codes. 
of specific keys on your keyboard. We're going to discuss two more things, and one is the on method, and the next one it will be effects and animations. But let's quickly show you what the on method looks like. The on method essentially acts like event, add event listener from vanilla JavaScript. So if I grab h1 and say dot on, I pass in an event. For instance, let's pass in double click. And then I pass in the function. And we can use the special this keyword to reference h1 here. And we'll say this, and we will toggle class to be turn blue. So what's happening here, I'm saying on double click call this function and this references the h1. So if I refresh this page, every time I double click on this, it's going to toggle this on and off. And my highlighting is making it seem a little weird because when you, when you double click something, it also gets highlighted. But hopefully you can see what I'm trying to convey here. And you can practice this on your own computer to get a better idea of it. All right. So let's show one last example. This is basically just like add event listener. So I can say something like mouse enter, save this, and this should actually be a lowercase e. Save that and refresh our page. And you'll see here as my mouse hovers over, it suddenly turns into blue. And now I can toggle the class just by hovering off and on. So now I can just have a single call with toggle class instead of the dual calls we saw back when I was using vanilla JavaScript. Okay, finally, let's talk about events and animations. Now you can go to api.jquery.com category slash effects to get more information about this. But basically, you can have animations or effects occur. We'll show you some very common ones. I'm going to say input dot eq and now I'm going to grab the second input, which if we look back at the HTML, it's the submit button. So I want something to happen when I click on submit. So I will say on click function. And then I'm going to grab everything in the container class. Let's put this in quotes here. So grab everything in that container class and say fade out. And you can pass in a number here in milliseconds. So I'm going to refresh this. If I hit submit, let's close this before I do that. I'll eventually see everything fade out within three seconds. So what is actually going on here? Well, this is just an animation that is available to you with jQuery. And basically, it's just fade out and you pass in a number of milliseconds that you want the fade out to take. There are many, many animations and effects available to you. But just to show you one more, you can use slide up. I will save this. Let's refresh the page. And as I click submit, I can see everything starts to get slide up or basically a wipe. And in order to get this back, I just have to refresh. Okay, so again, there's a link in the notes, or you can just go to api.jquery.com slash category slash effects get the, to get the full list of all the effects available to you here. We won't really be playing around with these too much throughout the rest of the course, but uh, you may find when you're dealing with your own website, it may be fun to add in your own animation using jQuery. All right, so go ahead and check out the notes if you want to review anything we covered here. But hopefully you now realize that jQuery makes your life really simple and a whole lot easier, especially when working with the DOM. Coming up next, we're going to have a Connect4 game project where we're actually going to make a working, a fully working front end website that has a Connect4 game on it. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to part three, the front end project. For this project, we're going to be coding through the creation of a Connect4 game. And we're going to be heavily using jQuery for this project. And just a quick note, we probably are using jQuery more than we actually should. So I really want to focus your knowledge of jQuery for this project. 
we will be using jQuery to actually build out the Connect4 game, when in reality it would probably be a smart idea just to use vanilla JavaScript arrays for a lot of the work here. We're going to be interacting with the DOM really heavily. So keep that in mind. We're going to be really focusing on jQuery for this project. There are many, many ways you could have built a Connect4 game using the front end stack that we know so far. This is just one way that heavily features jQuery and DOM. So this project is also completely optional. Feel free to only watch, to skip it completely, or to just tackle it straight on your own. This project will conclude our formal coverage of the front end stack. So really, if you've reached this point, pat yourself on the back. You've learned a ton already, and you've basically completed the entire front end stack. And after this, we'll be talking about the back end with Python and Django. All right, let's take a look at what this project actually looks like when completed, and then you can decide how you want to approach the project. After that, in the next few lectures, we're going to be coding through the solution. I'm going to hop over to my browser and show you what the project looks like. Okay, this is what the project looks like. Upon starting the project, you get an alert that says, player one, enter your name, you will be blue. So I will just input player one, and then player two, enter your name, you will be red. So we can give this some other name. Let's just give it the name B. You hit enter, and then we see this screen. So it says, welcome to Connect4. The object of this game is to connect four of your chips in a row. And player one and player two alternate. But the thing is, you only get to pick a column. And that is the column where you're going to drop either your blue or red chip. And it has to go all the way down. So for player one, it's your turn. So we can pick this column, and we can see our chip dropped all the way down. So as player B, if I also pick that column, it drops on top of that one. And we can continue this process until someone has won the game. Hopefully you're already familiar with Connect4. If not, you can always just read the rules. It's a very simple game. So here let's have blue win by connecting four. And once we've connected four, it says player one has won, refresh your browser to play again. And if I refresh my browser, I get the alerts again. So I will give player one A, player two B, and here the JavaScript has loaded and I'm ready to play again. And that's really all there is to this game. So feel free to either completely skip this project, tackle it completely on your own, or just have a code along section with me coming up in the next few lectures. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the solution lecture, part one for the front end project, where we're going to be coding through the solution for the Connect4 game. Let's get started by hopping over to our editor. Okay, so to get this project started, I have three files, an HTML file, a CSS file, and a JavaScript file. We're gonna start off with the HTML, then we'll style it with some CSS, and then finally, the majority of our time is going to be spent coding through the logic with jQuery and JavaScript. Let's get started with the HTML. So the HTML is actually quite straightforward. First, we just do the basic HTML call. We can give it the title connect4, save that. And then I wanna link to bootstrap, as well as my own CSS file. So let's start with my CSS, which is, I have it just being called game.css. So let me save that. And then I'm going to copy and paste the CDN link for bootstrap. And you can just copy and paste this yourself either from the notes or from boot, getbootstrap.com. So there's a CDN for bootstrap. Let's make sure everything's working just by saying hello in the heading and refreshing our HTML page. Okay, looks like it's connected and working. Let's start by putting everything into a div container so that we keep it organized and centered on the page. And I will make sure that it's completely aligned center by saying align center as a parameter in that div. And I'll have heading one say, welcome to connect four. I'll have heading two say something like connect four chips to win. And then H3 will say, let's start. I'm going to delete this, refresh, make sure everything's working. Looks like it's good. Now the task we have to accomplish is actually constructing the table that's going to be connect four. So what I'm going to do, and you don't have to do it this way, there's many ways you could build at this table, but I'm going to create a table row with each table cell, whoops, 
containing a button inside of it. And then something else I'm going to do is make sure I call table here. Let's put this row back inside that table. And then let's give this table a class equal to board so we can reference it later. Although this will be just the only table tag in our HTML, we could have just used the table tag to reference it later on, but we'll give it a class so it makes a little more sense. And then finally, type button. We don't need a name for this button and the button itself can be blank. So the idea is we're going to be clicking buttons on and off. We'll have them change color to depict whether the chip is inside of that area or not. And we need to add a couple more cells to this row. So we can just copy and paste this. There we go. So let's save that. It's going to be seven cells per row. And then I can just copy and paste this row and then continue on and connect four has six total rows. So I need to do this five more times. Let's make sure that's one row, two row, three row, four row, five row, six row, I believe. But let's actually make sure of this by refreshing our page. Here I can see a little table, it's kind of messed up. And that's because it's actually not inside of our container class. So let's bring this div all the way down here save this, refresh, and I can see I have a seven cell across in the rows and six rows total. Great. Finally, I want to, in my HTML, connect my script. So I'm going to call script and I will connect this to, we can say source, and I actually don't need to specify the type for now. We'll call it myscript.js. That's what my empty file is called right now. And then I also want to connect it to jQuery. So again, we just copy and paste the CDN. I'm going to do that here. You can either do it from the notes or from code.jQuery.com. So we have our HTML all set up. What we're going to do now is style it a little bit so that these buttons actually make sense. And you can see here, I can kind of click on these buttons right now, but it's way too small. Okay, so to start off the CSS, I'm going to call dot board and then every button within that. And then let's give them all a width of 100 pixels. Forgot the colon. And a height of 100 pixels. Going to save this. And here we can see we're starting to get something that looks quite a bit nicer. So if I zoom out a little bit here, we now have our Connect 4 board. Let's keep styling it a little more. Let's give them all a background color that's gray. Right now they have a bit of a fade to them. So if we refresh, we can see they're all gray now. We'll give them a bit of a margin so that we have a little space in between them. Save that, come up here, refresh. That's nice. And let's make them round. So to make them round, we use border radius. And we can just set this to be at 50% and that should make them circles. Okay, and then we get this kind of a weird effect over here when we click. And the way to get rid of that is by giving them a border. We'll give them a four pixel solid black border. Save, refresh, and here we can see our board is now complete. Okay, so our HTML is done and our CSS is done. Everything looks to be styled correctly. Coming up next, what we're going to be doing is dealing with the majority of our code, which is all happening on the JavaScript side. Thanks everyone, and I will see you in the next lecture where we're going to pick up right where we left off. All right, so here I am from where we left off last time. We have the empty JavaScript file, so we need to be using jQuery and JavaScript to actually grab elements from the document object model. But what we also now have is the HTML and CSS done for our project. There's a couple things we're going to need to be able to do. One thing we need to ask for the player names and then assign them their colors, red and blue. And I've picked some shades using RGB. Then the next thing we need to do is figure out a function that can change the color of a button. So if I click somewhere here, I wanna be able to change the color of that button. Now remember, we also need to figure out what a button's color is. So I need to make two functions that are very similar to each other. 
One is to find what color a button is if I click somewhere on a row or column index. And the other one is if I su supply a row index and a column index to actually change the color. So we'll be programming those out or coding them out. Then I also need a function that checks what is the bottom most available row. So if I click on one of these columns, I want my chip to go all the way down until it finally meets the last available gray button. So if these start getting filled up, I don't want it to mess up. I just want it to drop all the way down to the first gray button it sees. And we're going to be creating a function called check bottom that will check for the bottom and then supply back the row. Then we need to create a function that checks if four inputs are the same color to actually check for connect four. And then we need to create the win checks. So we need to make a check for horizontal wins. We need to make a check for vertical wins. And then we need to make a check for diagonal wins. After that, we need to check some way that the game has ended. Either everything is filled up and nobody's won, or somebody has won. After that, we want to actually create the game logic, where we start with player one. Player one will select something, we'll fill it in, then it goes to player two, they'll fit it in. And as they keep filling it in, we keep checking to see if somebody's won. And once somebody has won, we end the game and ask if they want to play again, or along those lines. All right, definitely check out the solution file for this. There are a lot of helpful functions there. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of the solutions file, there are actually helper functions that are commented out to help you understand how a table row index and a table column index work. It's actually kind of backwards. For instance, the very bottom row, the index here is row index five. So I have to check from five, four, three, two, one, zero, instead of zero, one, two, three, four, five. And the columns kind of feel backwards as well. So just keep that in mind. Uh, if you're confused on the indexing, definitely check out all the way at the bottom of the solutions JavaScript file. There are some helper functions to help you understand. So one of them is change color on click. So you can click on any of them and it will change the color for you. And the other one is to actually report back the index location of any button you click. So those are there to help you. They're not actually there for the game logic. Let's get started. I'm going to be doing a mix of coding and then copying and pasting from the solution if there's too much code, so just to save time. I'm going to copy and paste the very first lines of code and walk through them. So here are the first lines of code. Here I can see I'm asking player one through a prompt, enter your name and you will be blue. And then I'm saying that player one's color is this RGB code that I found. And then I have player two and I'm saying player two, enter your name, you will be red. And I set them to an RGB value. So this is some RGB code for red and this is some RGB code for like a light blue. And keep in mind, I'm using RGB because when we'll be using jQuery to change the actual color of the buttons, it expects a string in the form of RGB. And it also expects it with this sort of spacing here. So keep that in mind. That's why this is in this specific format instead of just like a hex code. Then I have game on, which is equal to true. That's going to be a Boolean variable that tells me whether the game is running or not. And then I have table here, which is just a jQuery call to table TR. Okay. Up next, let's create a report win function. I, again, I'm just going to kind of copy and paste this one. So report win, it takes in a row number and a column number. And then it says U1 starting at this row column. And this is just console log. So this is for a record for us so that we can check at the very end once the game is over, we log what was the winning move, what row number and what column number did they win at? This is not necessary for the actual code to work. This is just more of a convenience function for you as you're debugging. Now let's actually code something out manually. So I'm going to create a function called change color. And the change color function is going to take in a row index, a column index, and a color. And then we're going to return the table, remember the table is just that variable we got with jQuery. I'm going to use EQ and then pass in the row index to grab a row. Then I'm going to find TD values for those rows. And then I'm going to say EQ 
call index, and then I will say dot find the button there, and then I will say CSS, and then pass in background color, and change it to color. So that's a lot of code, and there's actually a link to a Stack Overflow article that really helps you out with this specific command right here. So I looked up on Stack Overflow, how do I get a table cell by index using jQuery? So if I know the row index and column index of a table, how can I use jQuery to grab that particular cell value from a table? And they came out with this really nice code where you just have that table, eq row index, find the table cell, and then eq column index, and then we added find the buttons, so we know their buttons, and then we have CSS background, color, and then color. What I would recommend you do is just kind of follow along with this and keep adding it. So in the console of your browser, say table, eq, and then say one, and then say dot find td, then say dot eq, and then some random column, and then say dot find button. So peel back the layers so you can understand it yourself. Next, what we want to do is create a function called return color, which is going to report back the current color of a button. And this is going to look virtually the same as the first function we just wrote, except in this case, we are not changing the color. So we don't need the colors to be a parameter and we don't need it to be an input here. And this will just report back the color. That way I can call it change, or excuse me, not change color, but we'll say return color or report color, whatever you want to call it. And this returns whatever color at this row at this column index for that particular button. The next function we're going to need is going to be the check bottom. And the check bottom function is going to take in a column index and then return the bottom row that is still gray. Let's actually code this one out. We'll say function check bottom. It takes in a column index. And we'll create a variable here called color report. And that's going to just be equal to the return color function. And we will start at five and then say col index. And the reason we're starting at five, whoops, don't actually want that set of brackets there. The reason we're starting at five is because I have a for loop and I'm going to go from, we'll change this to be row just so it's really clear. I'll start at row is equal to five and then I'm going to decrease the rows. So I will say row minus minus and I will keep going in my for loop until row is zero, meaning row greater than negative one. So as long as row is greater than negative one, starting at row is equal to five, keep subtracting the rows. And for each of these, what I'm going to do is grab the color report and set it equal to return color at the current row at my current column index. And then I will say this, if the color report is equal to gray, RGB 128, 128, 128, then I'm just going to return that row. Okay, so what's actually happening here? Well, I'm taking in a particular column index. So someone, let's imagine, is clicking on a column. And then what I'm doing is I'm grabbing a color report. Basically, this is just the initialization of this value, color report, since it's already gonna start at five. And that's return color at row index five, column index. So I'm just going up the rows, searching for the first gray button that I have available. Then I want another function that will check to see if four inputs are the same color. So we want some sort of color match function. Let's create one. I'm going to say function color match check and it will take in one, two, three, and four as variables. And then we're going to return and now let's check if it matches each one. So I want to check if button one matches two, and if button one matches three, 
and if button one matches four. And the other thing I want to check is to make sure that these buttons aren't gray buttons. So if I look at my board right now, I have connect four of gray buttons, so I don't want that to be a glitch or a bug. So I will say make sure one is not equal to the RGB color code, 128, 128, 128. And the other thing I also want to make sure is that if I'm checking for horizontal winds or checking for vertical winds and I accidentally start checking outside of the table cells, then I will get undefined calls. So I want to make sure that one is not equal to undefined. And that is my color match check. Essentially it grabs four buttons and makes sure one is equal to two, three, and four. And it also makes sure that one is not gray so we don't have four gray buttons and that we also don't have four undefined slots being matched together and thinking we have a color match. Now it's time to actually copy and paste the wind checks. So we have three functions for checking winds, a horizontal wind check, a vertical wind check, and a diagonal wind check. Let me copy and paste this code here. It's a lot of code, so you may have to zoom out to really see it well, but I'm going to briefly explain it. But before I do that, let me just explain the general logic over at the actual board. So let me bring back the board over here. This is what the board looks like. If I want to check for a horizontal win, what I'm going to do is starting over here, I'll check if these four are equal to each other. If they're not, I'll move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. If not, move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. If not, I'll move one over, check if these four are equal to each other. Which means for every row, I need to do four horizontal checks. And I know I have then six columns. Which means if I come over here to horizontal win check, that's exactly what we're doing in the for loops. I'm checking the columns. So there's six columns here, meaning, excuse me, there are six rows, level of rows. And there are four columns that I'm going to have to iterate through to check. And the phrasing here reflects that better than I just said. Basically, for the six rows, for four columns, do a color match check on row call, and then row call plus one, same row, call plus two, etc. So we're just moving along, checking these four. And then we're going to do that for six of these rows. And then I'm going to call report win so that I console log that a horizontal win occurred. And then I want to return true if there was a horizontal win check. If not, I'm going to just continue. So this is going to go all the way and it's going to return true if there's a horizontal win check. If not, if nothing happened, nothing's going to actually be reported back. This continue keyword is something we may not have encountered before, but it basically just tells the code to continue and not do anything. Another thing you could have just done here is log something or just alerted something. Probably a log so you're not constantly alerting your user. A log something like no match at row or call. Now if we scroll down, now we have the vertical win check and it's doing a really similar thing. It's going for the six columns here. Or let's count how many columns we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have seven columns, which makes sense because it's going up to seven. And then the rows we need to check here are one, two, three, four, go up one, one, two, three, four, go up one more, one, two, three, four, and that's it. That's your limit. Other than that, you're already off the table. So here we can see that I am just going to go through the seven columns, go three rows off the bottom, do a color match check, and then report the win, return true if I get the vertical win check. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue doing these four loops. Then I have the diagonal win check. And this one's a little more complicated, but it's a very similar idea to the first two. Basically what I'm doing is I'm saying the very first horizontal or excuse me, diagonal check happens right here. Hopefully you see this along. And then I'm going to continue doing the diagonal checks that essentially have a negative slope. And then I'm going to do all the diagonal checks to have a positive slope. And this is where our for loops come into play. And then we have the color match checks. And we can see here, if we scroll over, for some of them I'm saying plus one, plus one, plus two, plus two. And the other ones, I'm saying minus one, plus one, minus two, plus two. And that's basically the difference between the positive slopes for the diagonal checks versus the negative slopes for the diagonal checks. Essentially, 
whichever direction it's going diagonal from left up to the right or from left down to the right. Okay, so we have those three functions that check for wins. What I want to do is now actually create the game logic. For the next lecture, we'll be showing you how to create that game logic, as well as a few more helpful functions to really help us out as far as understanding how this game is working. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. So far, we've had the winning checks and the functions that actually check the colors and change the colors. What we need to do now is create all the game logic through so using jQuery that will actually assign all this to happen on a click. So as I mentioned earlier, this is kind of an extreme use of jQuery. You would probably want to use JavaScript arrays and more stuff on the back end if you're actually programming this. But this is kind of just to show the power of jQuery if you really want to force it to use the document object model manipulation. I'm going to start with player run. So I will say variable current player is equal to the number one. And then I will have the current name be equal to player one. And then I will have the current color be equal to player color, actually player one color, excuse me. So we start off with player one. So let's say that, start with player one. Then the next thing I wanna do is change the heading to indicate that it's player one. So I'm gonna use jQuery here to say h3.text and say player one it is your turn, pick a column to drop in. And then what I'm going to do is using jQuery, I will say board button on click call a function. And this function is basically going to call all my logic. Again, probably normally not what you would want to do, but this is going to allow us to kind of show off what jQuery can do. That we, and the fact that we can do this all through a DOM call instead of saving the tic-tac-toe board to an array or a nested array. So here I'm going to say a variable column, and I'm going to need to recognize what column was chosen. And I can do that with the this call here. So this keyword is going to indicate what column the person clicked on. And then I can actually say closest TD to find the closest cell to this and then get the index of that. So that's the column. And again, there's a stack overflow link in the notes to indicate some terms that we didn't cover, such as closest and then dot index. But off of that, we need to then get back the bottom available row to change. So I'm going to say this variable bottom of ale is equal to check bottom passing in that column. And then I want to drop the chip in the column that is at the bottom available row. So I will call change color and pass in bottom of ale col and then current color. And now we want to check if there's a win or a tie. So I'm going to say if there's a horizontal win check or there is a vertical win check that returns a Boolean or there is a diagonal win check. Then what I'm going to need to do is end the game. And to indicate the game has ended, we can just do something like jQuery call h1 and change its text to say something like winning, let's say, whatever player we currently are on, which is the current player. Actually, it's going to be the current name. Current player is just the actual number, 
one, which will show later on how we're actually going to switch from player one to player two. But we will say current name, you have one. So we actually change the heading there. And we can change some other things too. We can do a fade out. So let's practice that. I'm going to say h3 dot fade out. So that's an animation that you can find on that jQuery link. And then I'm also going to do the same thing for h2 dot fade out. And in the solutions, this is actually done as a separate function. This whole wind check is a separate function. And then it's call in fast. And you can also pass in milliseconds there. All right. So if I get either a horizontal wind check, a vertical wind check, or a diagonal wind check, I'm going to change my heading one text to say current name, you have one. And then I'm going to fade out fast, fade out fast from the other three headings, or two headings, excuse me. Then what we need to do is recheck who the current player is and change the current player. So if I'm still continuing after this, it means there is no win or tie. So I'm going to say the current player is equal to the current player times negative one. And then I'm going to use that actual number to change the reassignment. So I will say if current player is equal to positive one, well then I know we're at player one. So I know the current name is player one. Remember that was the prompt from the very first lines of code. And then what I'm going to do is change using jQuery, my heading three, to say some text such as current name, it is your turn. And then else, I know it's the other player's name, so I'm going to say current name is equal to player two and then change the heading for player two. We'll say h3 text current name, it is your turn. And then I wanna change the current colors as well. So we'll say current color is equal to player two color and let's do the same thing up here. So here I will say current color is equal to player two color, excuse me, player one color. So we can save that. And then we can continue if I come up here, I can change the color to the current color at the bottom available at that column. So this basically is going to keep cycling whenever I click the board. And that is all you have to do to actually make connect Four work. Now I know I say that's all you have to do. This is quite a bit of effort especially since we're really trying to juice the most out of jQuery instead of using something like an array. But let's actually save this and refresh our page and see if it worked. Going to refresh. I get player one into your name. Let's call it A. Player two enter your name. Let's call it B. We'll hit OK. Let's see if I can drop it. Great. And then it says bit, it's your turn, or it should say B, it, it is your turn. So we will keep dropping it. And we can see here, let's practice getting a vertical win. And it says, B, you have one. Perfect. And then I just have to refresh the page. I'll start again with A and then B. Let's get a horizontal win here. And looks, whoops, I accidentally clicked too many times, but I also got the horizontal win. And now let's make sure the diagonal win is working as well. So we'll make some player names. It's just junk. And let's make those names. We'll say, try to get blue to be diagonal here. And we're gonna keep going. And there's the diagonal win. Great. All right, if you have any questions for this, feel free to post to the Q&A forums. But something I wanna make clear is, really this is just an exercise to show what's possible with jQuery and the front end stack that we've learned. You would probably wanna do most of this sort of stuff either on the back end or by taking advantage of JavaScript's data structures like in array, especially for this type of problem. You would not wanna have so much logic on just a simple click with all this jQuery. This is more just to show how much you can juice jQuery 
uh, given what we know so far. Okay, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next section of the course where we're going to begin our move to the back end. Hello everyone, and welcome to an introduction to the back end. So welcome to the back end half of the course, and before we begin, we're going to get a brief overview of what to expect for this entire second half of the course. But I also want you to congratulate yourself because you've already learned so much about the entire front end stack, and we're going to continue on learning about the back end stack and get that full stack web developer knowledge. But again, congratulate yourself, you've learned a ton already. Okay. So to use Django and Python effectively, a basic level of understanding the command line is necessary. And these commands are sometimes slightly different for Windows users versus Mac OS and Linux users. So refer to the notes for full examples and reference commands, since we're only going to need to know a few of them to get started. So the next lecture is going to have a quick overview and a basic introduction to command lines and using that command prompt or terminal if you're on Mac OS or Linux. And there's also full notes with written explanations in case you want to reference those. That's just going to be a quick overview lecture, and that's actually all that's in this particular section of the course. Then in the next section, in order to use Django, we need to have a pretty good understanding of Python. So we have Python level one and Python level two. And we need to learn Python up to the point of object-oriented programming. If you already have previous experience with Python, feel free to skip certain lectures, uh, look around in the curriculum, and see what's a good starting point for you. And I'll remind you to do that again when we actually reach those Python lectures. Once we've learned enough Python, we can begin to use the Django web framework to create websites. And let's go over a very high level overview of how Django actually works. And don't worry if you don't fully understand this, this is just kind of to plant a seed in your mind. That way, once you actually reach Django, you can remind yourself, oh, that's what we were talking about in the introduction lecture. Okay, so this is a very high level overview of Django. Basically, a user will request a URL on your website, something like www.hello.com. Then that's going to go to a urls.py file, which is then going to call the views.py file in Django. And the URLs are just connected to views through a simple call. And then that will call your models.py, which contains all the information of your database. And then that will query your database for the information, feed it back to views.py, which creates the view of your website, what it actually looks like. And then we use templates to fill out that view with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then we send that back to the user. So far, we now know the front end technologies and that mainly falls right there under the templates. That's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What we're going to be doing next is learning enough Python so then we can use Django to actually understand this essential workflow. Okay, so now it's time to learn Python enough to successfully use the Django framework that we just described as a very high level overview. And as we go through the back end, make sure to visit the documentation for Django. It's actually really well written and we'll get into why it's so well written later on when we talk about Django. Okay, now a quick caveat and a quick note. Many Django tutorials dive straight into a clone project where you're guided through a clone of a popular website. Maybe they guide you through a clone of Twitter or Reddit, etc. This course is going to take a slightly different split approach where we create a very simple website first and then we move on to clones. So we first develop a very simple website and the website is just going to be a simple registry of user provided links with some basic user interactivity. The reason we don't do a clone at first is because this doesn't really provide the best learning experience for fundamental concepts. With the simpler website approach, we can give really clear explanations on the actual fundamental concepts and how Django works. Usually if you just start off straight with a clone, you have a good idea of how to create that specific clone website, but you don't really have a good understanding of the fundamentals in order to create your own specific websites. And this approach also allows us to add in exercises that you can try out independently. So that way we can test your knowledge on the core concepts instead of just guiding you through a code along where you don't really get a chance to test your knowledge. Once we've gotten the main concepts down with the simple website, then we can tackle clone projects. The later sections of the course will then utilize those clone projects to introduce more advanced co concepts, things like social logins, authorization, security, deployment, etc. So we do have clones and they're a great way to introduce those topics in a fun and interesting way. All right, get ready to learn a lot. This half of the course is where you really get to build all the cool stuff and eventually you'll find yourself just staring at your computer thinking, whoa, did I just build a freaking website? And it's really exciting stuff. Okay, thanks everyone and I'll see you at the next lecture.
Hello everyone, and welcome to this quick lecture of a command line crash course. Being able to navigate your computer through the command line is a vital skill for any web developer, or any general programmer. Some commands are slightly different depending on if you use a Windows computer or a Mac OS or Linux computer. In this lecture, we're going to briefly go over a few of the important commands you should know and point out any OS differences that you may find yourself facing. And you can always use the downloaded notes for reference. So there is a folder in the downloaded notes called Command Line Crash Course, and everything I'm going to be talking about is detailed and noted for you in those notes. And there's a separate text for Windows computers and a separate text for Mac OS and Linux users. Mac OS or Linux users share the same set of command lines. It's only Windows users that are a little different from those two. I'm on a Windows computer right now, so I'll walk through the Windows text file just to show you how it works, and I'll make sure to note any differences that occur if you're using a Mac. Let's get started. I'm going to open up my command prompt. All right, so here I am at my command prompt and notice that for a Windows computer, your location is usually just told to you here on the left. So I can see here that I'm under a user folder. If I wanted to know all the folders that were under this current directory, I could use the dir command for a Windows computer. And that will, if I hit enter, show me everything that's under that current directory. So here you can see I have a lot of documents and you also notice that if they start with a dot, that means they're basically hidden. So if you're looking at this in your finder or your Windows viewer, you won't find those. So that's the command for a Windows computer. On a Mac OS or a Linux computer, the command to view all your files in the current directory is ls and that stands for list. So again, ls is for Mac OS and Linux users and then dir is for Windows users. Now let's talk about changing directory. Imagine that I actually want to go to a specific file here. Let's say I want to go to this videos file. How do I do that? Well, this command is actually the same whether you're on any operating system like Mac or any operating system like Windows, etc. What you do is you type cd, which stands for change directory. And then you type in the next directory underneath the directory you currently are in that you want to go to. So for example, if I want to go to videos, I just type CD videos, hit enter, and you can see that I've changed directory into CD videos. If I want to go back up a directory, again, this is the same for both operating systems. You do CD dot dot, and that will take you back up one. If you don't quite remember what directory is you're looking for, you can just start typing the directory and then use tab to autocomplete. You can keep hitting tab until you find the one you want. So in this case, I want CD video, so I can do that again. And we go back with CD. And that's how that works. Okay, now let's discuss clearing the screen. I have a lot of stuff here right now. This is a little different depending if you're on a Mac or a Windows. On a Windows computer, it's CLS to clear the command prompt. On a Mac OS or Linux, it's clear. So again, CLS for Windows to clear your screen, clear for a Mac OS or Linux. And you can always reference the notes here if that's easier for you. All right, so we learned how to list all the folders in a current directory. We learned how to clear the screen. If you ever want to display your current directory, you can just look here on the left if you're on Windows. On a Mac or Linux computer, sometimes it's not so obvious what directory you're currently in. So you can just type in PWD, which stands for Print Working Directory. Again, that's for Mac OS and Linux users in case you want to print out or display your current directory. If I am on a Windows, I can either just look to the left or also just typing CD will also print out my current directory, but you can see it's exactly the same as what was already displayed for me. Okay, so now that we learned how to display our current directory, we are basically done with everything that we needed to cover for the command line crash course. There's also things such as make directory if you want to make a new folder. That's going to be something like make directory mkdir, and that's the same for any uh, operating system. And then you just say whatever the new directory you want, so something like new folder. But we're not going to be doing that too often throughout the course. And if we ever do touch upon some command lines that you haven't seen yet, I'll be sure to let you know uh, what they are and how we use them. But for right now, the only ones you should really be aware of is how to change directory. The most useful one is, again, CD, type in the directory name you're looking for, for example, videos. You can use tab to help autocomplete this. 
And then if you ever want to go back, it's just cd dot dot. That's really the main one that I want you to know, change in directory. And that's the same regardless of your operating system. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture.